Welcome to the virtual Steelite experience where we are relaunching the industry together. Thanks for joining us today. I'm your host, Sunny Abada, coming to you live from the Steelite showroom and experience center in Youngstown, Ohio. Now, normally we would all be together in Chicago at the National Restaurant Show, but today we are bringing you all of this excitement and action virtually. We're creating new experiences and showcasing some of the latest products. So whether you're watching on Zoom, YouTube, or Facebook, our goal with this event is to join the hospitality industry and relaunching as everything opens back up. So get ready to be emerged in all things Steelite. Here's what you can expect during our time together today. New products in action with Chef Jamie Simpson, Executive Chef of the Culinary Vegetable Institute in Milan, Ohio, and Chef Mark Canzanetta, owner and chef at the Bistro 1907 here in Youngstown. They'll be presenting their beautifully plated creations live in the Steelite kitchen on Magogo's modular chef station. You'll also hear inspirational stories from industry leaders while learning about product innovations from Steelite International. Plus, we have an entire crew in our Chicago showroom as well, where Dave Turner, chief evangelist of the Tabletop Journal, is standing by live to show you more new products and interviews with your favorite food service service professionals. Now here in Youngstown, we have several Steelite experts joining us as well, along with special guests, including Farmer Lee Jones from the Chef's Garden and David Haber of DW Haber. Of course, this event wouldn't be complete without Steelite's memorable cocktail party, which admittedly looks a little different this year than what you're used to. We're going to be mixing it up with two cocktail demos featuring, featuring three of the best mixologists in the industry, Tony Abuganem, Greg Best, and Julia Momose. Now we do have a few housekeeping notes for you before we start. We have invited many of our fellow industry friends to join us in person as we broadcast live right here in Youngstown as well as Chicago. But just so you know, safety is a top priority for Steelite. Everyone will be practicing social distancing and following the respective cities and CDC's COVID-19 guidelines upon entering the showrooms. So now that we've addressed that, just as we would at the restaurant show, we would love to hear your feedback here. So please leave the comments, leave any questions you might have on any of the live streaming platforms, and we'll have our team members re actively respond as they come in. And of course, there is something in it for you as well. We've got some great giveaways today, so stay tuned throughout the event to participate. But first, to set your virtual stage, let's hear from Steelite International President and CEO, John Miles. Hi, everyone. Welcome to the Steel and International virtual experience. It's great to be here with you today. When we learned that the National Restaurant Show, for obviously good reasons, would be canceled for the second year in a row, our team began to talk about how we could come to you in a different way. We consider the National Restaurant Show the Super Bowl for our industry. We consider it the thing that knits us all together, gives us the opportunity to share, visit, and learn with one another every year. That wasn't going to happen, and as a result, our team got together and decided how we could share a virtual experience with everyone. When you think about the, the National Restaurant Show, you think about our entire industry, not just the tabletop industry, but us all together. I think about how much we learn, how much we interact, how many people we meet, how many end users we learn from on a daily basis. And what we wanted to try to do with this event is to try to bring us all together. Unfortunately, I can't replace the National Restaurant Show, but what we're trying to do is bring you a sliver of that togetherness today. I hope you enjoy it. Okay, back live here in studio with John chatting with us. John, I know this experience, as we mentioned, does look a little different, but it's really exciting to be able to bring all these products together in one spot. So tell us what you're most excited about today. I mean, listen, I think that everyone who goes to the National Restaurant Show goes to experience new things and learn. And it's our attempt to give a little bit of that back to everyone who participates in the industry. What do you want to say to anyone in the hospitality industry, which admittedly was hit a little hard during the COVID season? The thing that we want to say the most is we miss you, <laughs> all of you. Can't wait to see you, and we hope today helps to make things a little bit better. It'll certainly inspire them. John, thank you thank so you much. Thank you so much. Now, normally you would see our beautiful displays at McCormick Center. Today, we've brought them to you virtually, as we said, at our showroom right here in Youngstown. So take a look at some of the new products you'll see today.
All right, so who is ready for our first giveaway of the day? We are giving away a set of Steelite China. All you have to do is comment below either on Zoom, Facebook, or YouTube, and mention how many products you think you saw in that last video. We'll randomly select a winner and we'll notify you at the end of the show. Now we want to take it live to Chicago to check in with our friends at the Steelite showroom there. Dave Turnell of Tabletop Journal there as your Chicago guide today. How's it going, Dave? It is, it is fantastic out here to be in Chicago at this time of the year. We're always here. And this year without the NRA show, it's a little bit different, but it, it's, it's great here in the Steelite showroom. We've got great products. We've got great people. And we've got some great information for our listeners and our video uh, audience. Uh, we're, first of all, we're going to start off with a great new product from Steelite uh, from Maham Anjum. She's got a fabulous collection. If you don't fall in love with this collection, you have a problem. I'm telling you, it's a great product. It's a studio product, but it's made with steel, as typical Steelite fashion, made to stand up to all the practical rigors that you see in the food service business. That's number one. Number two, we're starting with a, a, another new product. Steelite Revolution Edge. It's a mix and match pattern. You're going to love it. It's got all the qualities you know Steelite for. It's robust. It'll still hold up in high volume situations and it mixes and matches with all kinds of other Steelite products. And we're going to show you just how that's done later on. Yep. We also have here Rene Osorio, the newest from Rene Osorio. Rene Osorio is a world famous designer. He's been doing restaurants and hospitality venues for 15 or 20 years, and he gets the subliminal effects of dinnerware. And we love deal dealing with uh, Rene Osorio. It's just fabulous product, but it's a great another one that mixes and matches very well. We're also gonna have, we don't can't bring it on cam uh, camp camera right now, but we're gonna have Magogo. Magogo is a fabulous buffet wear line. They do great furniture and they get it. They get the connection between food and furniture. And then finally, the cocktail component of this thing, it's in very good hands. We've got Julia Mamose, who is a, she's told me just now, she's a bartender, not a mixologist. She's coming on and she's, she is the party, my friends. Julia, welcome. Thank you so much for having me. I'm thrilled to make some cocktails with everyone. The party is about to begin in Chicago, folks. Anyway, Sonny, we're gonna to toss it back to you. Have fun in Youngstown. We're gonna have a ball out here in Chicago. It sounds like you already are. Dave, thank you, Julia. Look forward to seeing you as well. Now we wanna show you a featured collection. Let's take a look right now at the Maham Studio Collection. This stunning terracotta stoneware with reactive glaze hues has true durability and it is beautifully designed and created by Maham Anjum. The Maham Spice Collection can bring a fresh and exciting look to your tabletop. My name is Anna Deanda and I'm Chef's Roll's Test Kitchen Pastry Chef. My style is colorful and vibrant, so when choosing a plate I focus on versatility. I like a canvas that's not too ornate but still beautiful and can carry my dish through, which is why I chose to plate my dish on the Maham Studio Sea Salt Spice Plate by Steeler. This is a matcha panna cotta with strawberry gel, white chocolate mousse, matcha crumble, fresh strawberries and dehydrated meringue. And for a hands-on look at the Maham Spice Collection, Steelite Senior Product Manager Cami Ricketts is joining us here in the Youngstown studio. What are the unique aspects of the Maham Collection? Well, the Maham Studio Spice Collection was designed with intentionality. Um, from the shapes and sizes that you see here, to the reactive glaze color palette, to the stackability of many of the shapes. Um, the biggest challenge that we had was to uh, recreate um, the look and feel of terracotta mm -hmm. into a commercially viable product while maintaining the design integrity of the product at the same time. Okay. So you had mentioned that it is a stoneware terracotta, mm -hmm. and so it is actually a vitrified stoneware which brings the strength and durability to the product with a beautiful terracotta color that's infused within the body of itself. Um, each piece, you know, actually is two-toned in design. So you see that there is a glaze on top and the exposed stoneware on the bottom. Um, that has to be hand applied, and that's a very unique feature. So we've exposed the bottom as well as the rim of the piece, which actually frames the food. Um, and you notice, Sunny, that the beautiful terracotta color, I mean, it's this rich, gorgeous hue of brown. And we feel like each piece really is, uh, the bottom of each piece is as beautiful as the top. And so that's created some new and exciting ways to plate food. And I have an example here where you see a plate that we've actually put upside down 
and we're using the natural design elements of the plate paired with some sauce dishes. And so now you have a new way to show, you know, to serve bread and butter. You have a new way to do shareable appetizers or desserts. And what we really want the customer to see is that um, by adding just a little bit of spice, you can elevate the design ex or the <laughs> experience for your patrons. Yeah, absolutely beautiful. A lot of versatility there too. So tell us where you see this being used. Oh, you know, this, this collection really is very versatile. It can be used just about any kind of operation. Um, what we found is that the colors actually coordinate very well with a lot of our existing products. Um, they match a lot of the new Steelite products, Robert Gordon, um, Renee Osorio, and even Homer Laughlin. So what's really cool about that is that operators who already have our beautiful existing products don't have to do a whole new tabletop. If they add just a few pieces, they can actually spice up their line. Yeah, to use a line. And what is the inspiration behind this collection? Um, really, Maham, um, you know, this is something that is, is her baby, and we're going to see, you know, her a little bit with the video. Um, this is something that she has been wanting to take commercially to the, to the market for several years. She does all this product in her own studio in London. And so, you know, she really wanted to translate what she does in studio and make it, you know, for, for the vast variety of food service and make it an offering that we actually, Steel Light, offers globally. Beautiful. Cami, thank you so much. Now we do want to catch up with award-winning ceramic designer Maham Anjum from her workshop in London, England. My name is Maham. I'm a London-based designer maker working in ceramic. I develop and make tableware exclusively for chefs and restaurants. I've always been inspired by everyday pottery, utilitarian items that you can eat out of and cook in. London has a diverse food scene and I've been lucky enough to work with some of the top chefs representing different kinds of cuisines. People like Vinit Bhatia, Asma Khan. I studied ceramic design at Central St. Martins and then the Royal College of Art in London. I think it's my experience working with Queensbury Hunt that gave me a sound uh, knowledge of ceramic design in an industrial context and also at the same time working with artisan potters in developing countries uh, that informs my work. The connection between the plate and the food is very important because there's a lot of love uh, that goes into creating that, making that plate, and in the same way there's a lot of love that the chef puts in making that dish and plating it and presenting it to the customer. So what we've taken from my bespoke work into the Steelite range is some of the handmade qualities. For example, the beaded rim. We've also kept the, the reactive glaze look and importantly, leaving the outside unglazed and having the glazed inside. So the tactility of the bowl or the product, we've tried to keep that in this range. Our in interaction with Maham happened much later in the in the journey of the Cinnamon Club. Having met Maham and exchanged some ideas and, and understood how Maham had studied pottery. Obviously it's about the ingredient and it's obviously about the cooking. It's obviously about taste first. But I think now more than ever, we eat with our eyes first. Working with terracotta as a plate to put dishes on and also from a customer's point of view to actually receive something which did feel a lot more craft, a lot more genuine, a lot more authentic. I didn't see this as, you know, something that is handmade, this is made in a factory. For me, it was all about the, the soul, the vibe, but the look. And as Maham was guiding me with everything I was buying from Steelite, and you know, and Andrew was listening to Maham, there was a synergy in everything that we had. Beautiful handmade, you know, tableware, you know, with factory made stuff, mixed with something else, with some bespoke, you know, finishing. 
But for me, this is how it was. It was done so naturally, you know, so I'm just trying to present food with honor and respect. But the colors and the depths and the nuance of the kind of, you know, what my cuisine is, that is what I'm presenting. Then the plate becomes even more important. I met Steelite uh, in Frankfurt a few years ago and then met Andrew Klemecki and we hit it off because we both share this passion for design and uh, hospitality. The way that Maham works with customers is very similar to the way we, we approach that um, as well. So there was a there was a very strong synergy with, with, with the way that uh, that we both worked. So it made uh, collaborating with, uh, with Maham uh, extremely easy because we work in, in very much the same way. So over the years, Maham had brought together a collection of various items and, and sizes that had worked best for lots of different chefs. So what we did was we collated um, that body of work down to a much more manageable range. And Steelite brought their sensibilities in terms of stackability, durability, ease of use, and, and also the sensibilities in terms of being able to uh, produce items that, that presented certain portion size as well. So we, we collaborated uh, both aesthetically and from a, a kind of functionality um, aspect uh, to produce the range uh, that, that we see now. Uh, the clay body is a, is a, a unique formulation uh, that has the aesthetics of terracotta but also is much more durable um, and can withstand you know, a busy kitchen and, and, uh, and a busy restaurant. The range can be used together, all of the products uh, on the table, or it can be used in conjunction with other Steelite ranges, Bone China or the Steelite Vitrified China. All right, now we are back live in the Youngstown kitchen area this time with sales associate Kylie Passaretti. We also have Mark Canzanetta, owner and chef at Bistro 1907. Don't go far because you're going to be cooking for all of us very soon. Kylie, we want to start with you to talk more about this collection. It's very warm. It's very artisanal. Tell us about the color palette and the materials here. Absolutely. So the spice collection is unique to the Steelite portfolio because of the very vibrant and trendy color palette in combination with the warm, unglazed terracotta base, which folds over the lip of the piece framing the food beautifully. It also complements a lot of our existing collections like Steelite or Robert Gordon um, very nicely, but can stand alone on its own just, just as well. Uh, for example, customers could add in just a couple pieces to their existing tabletop to really spice things up um, and completely transform the look. With this neutral, reactive, semi-matte glaze, it would add a different dimension and texture to the overall tabletop presentation. So tell us what type of customer you most envision using this collection. So the Spice collection is very chef and designer driven, but we're bringing it to market at a really great price point that it's going to be appealing to both high-end and mid-range customers. Uh, this bowl, for example, would be great for small bites at a bar, but could also be used in a fine dining restaurant. It really lends itself to multiple segments. Absolutely beautiful. We want to touch on this flatware as well before we go. Tell us what we're seeing here. Okay, so this is Charm. This is the newest flatware pattern by the La Tavola collection. Um, and like all La Tavola flatware pieces, uh, it's a stunning 1810 body. This one specifically has this gorgeous teardrop round handle, but what makes this pattern so special is the exceptional price point. So this is a pattern that's going to be used for high volume markets, such as banqueting, for example. Absolutely beautiful. Kylie, thank you so much. We're going to shift over to Chef Mark to tell us what you are plating, which looks absolutely oh, delicious. The Maham is just beautiful. I really do. And you know, to get an artisan package like this and product like this, but yet have the durability and strength as a restaurant owner, that really means a lot to us. Yeah, tell us why that's so important, that durability factor. Well, the durability factor, because of course we have to have a maintenance to our profit and loss statement, so we need to maintain that. And you know, when servers have accidents, um, 
they break. But these are very, very durable. And the great thing I love about it, the textured rim. The textured rim for a food server, they can grab onto that, and it's not going to slip out of their hand. So strength, durability, reliability. I think it's a fantastic plate. Tell us about what you prepared. We can't oh, skip over that part. Jumbo prawns, you know, and then we have a spiced pickled beet puree, uh, ancho chili puree, and then an herb puree. And then we just gently cook those in court bouillon and a little bit of herb oil around the outside. Absolutely delicious. I know you're going to hang around with us I for am. a while. I okay, am. Mark, thank you so you're much. Uh, for even more inspiration, we're going to check out now how our friends at Chef's Roll are using Maham. My name is Anna Deanda, and I'm Chef's Roll's Test Kitchen Pastry Chef. For this dish, I chose to feature the Maham Studio Sea Salt Spice Plate by Steelite because it was a blank canvas for my components to stand out. When looking for a plate, I like to focus on versatility, a plate that has style of its own but can still reflect my style as well. This is a blueberry mousse entremet with lemon sponge cake, crumble, white chocolate mousse, blueberry gel, lemon gel, pickled blueberries, dehydrated meringue, and blueberry dust. Okay, we have Chef Jamie now joining us on set, who is also using the Maham Collection. Tell us about what you're plating here, Chef Jamie. This is another walk through the garden for us, and every day is a, a walk through the garden. We're working with a page out of the book, literally, which we'll go through later. This is a shaved radish salad on a soft poached egg yolk, mm -hmm. um, a little butter and corn for a soured focaccia. And um, we're just going to finish the dish with some crystal lettuces, which we'll get into a little bit as well. Yeah, we're going to talk, as you said, a little later in the show about the fresh ingredients and how important it is with you to work with farmers to bring this type of not only delicious, but beautiful um, sort of pictures to people's plates. Tell us about that relationship and why it's so important to have those fresh ingredients. We coined the phrase, Steelite frames your food uh, for a reason, you know, especially as Chef Mark mentioned, you know, this, this plate really does frame your food. I think these plates are a perfect canvas for this sort of natural organic vibes we're after. Yeah. Okay, well, we look forward to catching up with you in a bit as well. Chef Jamie, thank you so much. The Maham Studio Collection is also set up in our Chicago showroom today where we have Dave from Tabletop Turner joining us once again. Dave, how are people reacting to Maham Studio where you are? It's all Maham here all the time. Everybody loves Maham in her products, especially. I've got Jack Eaton here. He's the regional vice president for sales for Steelite. Jack, what do you think of the Maham range? I know, I know Maham for many years. And she's always dealt with the best of the best in the terms of the chef community. She's always looked to them for her guidance and developing her products, but you see them in a special way too. Tell us about that. Um, we're beyond excited, Dave, here to have Chicago um, having the Maham product now. Uh, so we're, we're really gonna hit the ground running with it. You know, this product in and of itself, I would say you really need to see in person. So for the Chicago market, anyone out there listening, I would say come down and visit us. Um, you know, we have the samples here. You can see, you can touch, you can feel, um, and you can plate on it. So that's the most important thing. Um, the, Maham, the Maham product is very tactile, very sensual. It feels good in your hand. And I love the, that you get it visually, but you also get that sensory kind of feel when you touch the product, don't you? Yeah, it's a really multi-dimensional product. Um, my personal favorite part about it is just the contrast between glazes. So you have kind of a smooth plating surface, but you have that texture on the back of it, and it really all comes together in a really impressive way. Yeah, it's a, it's a product that's made in the studio, but because it originally came out of the studio with that in mind in its DNA, but now you can see it's made for industrial use, very uh, handle the practical rigors of the food service business, wouldn't you say? Yeah, absolutely. That's the key, I think, to the product is the aesthetic of it, but also paired with the durability aspect um, has, has made it a huge success even so far. Yeah, I love the colors too, but uh, and this is not available today, but it's coming very soon, right? Yes, correct. It's coming very soon. Uh, we have, you know, samples starting to become available and obviously we're showing it here in Chicago today. So for everyone out in Chicago, come by uh, and see us in the showroom and we'd love to show it to you. You know, there's so many pieces to the Maham collection. I can't decide which one I love, but I'll tell you my one of my favorite. This one right here. This is the little jug. And this is the sexiest little thing I've seen in a long time in the tabletop business. Maham, you hit it out of the park with this one. Thanks a lot, Jack. Sonny, we're back to you in Youngstown. Thank you so much, Dave. We're going to check back with Dave as well. Now, the Maham Studio Collection makes an ideal plate for pastries as well. Just ask prestigious pastry chef Antonio Bashur, who is known worldwide for his hyper creative desserts. Hi, my name is Antonio Bashur. I'm from Bashur, Miami. 
My first interaction with Still Art, uh, I think was in New York, like uh, 20 years ago, uh, when I was working at the big hotel Five Star. I fell in love with Still Art from that. Today I'm playing with uh, Maham Studio Spy Stone Dishes from Bashur, Miami. I'm very happy, first time I saw this play, and I fell in love with them. They match very well with my dessert because both of them, they are colorful, they show happiness, uh, and they're beautiful. What makes us feel like different from another Chinese company? First, is the customer service is the best. Uh, the plate, uh, for me, is beautiful. The design, the quality of the plate of the China is the best in the market. For me, I'm very proud. Um, I'm very humble, proud that I still work with me like ambassador. For me, it's an honor. I always working with the best company, and for me, still is one of the best company in the world. Chef Antonio continues to teach pastry around the world and work on his two restaurants in Coral Gables and Doro, Florida. So thank you so much, Chef. All this food talk has us thinking about a refreshing cocktail here. So Tony, Greg, and Julia, do you think you can help us out with that? I think we feel pretty good about that. You know, uh, I'll, I'll tell you, you know, while y'all have been talking about food, we've been getting just as excited about the beverage. And seeing these new glasses, the Bormioli Rocco American 20s line, uh, the, the Aspen uh, Everclear line, we're, we're, we're stoked. And it reminds us that, you know, uh, getting back to simplicity has really been an emerging trend in beverage as we've come out of the past year and a half. And, you know, we were thinking if it's going to be simple, it should be spritz simple, right? It should be spritz simple, Greg, and I love fizzy drinks. The simplest, most difficult drinks to make perfectly, and starting with a simple highball, two ingredients, spirit and carbonated mixer, but it, how you handle those and choose those ingredients and pay attention to the details, starting with the glassware. I mean, it was Bill Kelly and the roving bartender that once wrote, Prior to Prohibition, you would go into a saloon, you would order a drink for 12 and a half cents that was served in a glass that cost $6 a dozen. So it shows how important glassware yeah. was. Yeah. So really paying attention to the details, the ice, the fresh ingredients, the carbonated mixer, the spirit, the glassware, the garnish, to really elevate drinks like highballs, like Collins, like fizzes, and you know, you've got me thinking. You're talking. You're saying the word fizz, and I don't know about the weather where all of y'all, our virtual uh, bar patrons, are right now. But here in Youngstown, it's a little warm and it's a little humid, and that reminds me of a specific place, uh, New Orleans. Oh, and you see what I'm doing here? Yeah, you t <laughs> you're talking about the Godfather of fizzes, the That's Ramos right. Gin Fizz. That's right. 1888, Henry Ramos, the Cabinet Saloon one of my favorite daytime drinking or anytime drinking uh, fizzes. But, it's the best. And it, it does require a little bit of work. Um, yeah. so, simple sorry it's Sorry not. in advance, Julia. <laughs> I, know, uh, I know you're all the way over there, but uh, I, I, I'm sure you can handle this as well. <laughs> you know, Chicago is seeing a gorgeous, sunny 80 degree day as well. And the Ramos Gin Fizz is one of my absolute favorite drinks, honestly, to start the day off with, but as a mid afternoon little pick me up, I think it's a brilliant way to go. And Tony, I know you have a gorgeous recipe for us, so I'll let you take it away. Oh, thank you very much, Julia. Yeah, I started making Ramos Gin Fizz in 1985 when I worked at the Balboa Cafe in San Francisco. And I got pretty good at it, but they do uh, require special ingredients and require a lot of shaking. And the key at the end of it is that beautiful carbonation that gives it that fizzy texture. So um, yeah. we got our work cut out for us. We do have our work cut out for us. All right, Sonny, we pro should probably hand this back to you while we get prepping here at the bar. And we will not forget to check back with you guys. Thank you so much. Now we turn our attention to two new products from Steelite, introducing Essence and Atelier designed by Rene Azorio. Now, Azorio is distinguished by his style and his eclectic philosophy. The pause from the pandemic inspired a simpler approach to this line, and he delivered on his design with Essence by Rene Azorio. The collection provides a modern and classic tabletop look. And Atelier by Rene Azorio is an elegant and eye catching embossed collection. My name is Gianna Bezzetta. I am the executive pastry chef at Dijomar Restaurant and the Wild Time Catering Company. I chose the Atelier Plate by Rene Azarillo and Steelite because of its versatility and crisp texture. My dish today is toasted rice panna cotta, butter poached and brulee rutabaga, 
roasted cherries, rice wine fermented white blueberries, and burnt arugula dust. Finished off with radish and arugula blossoms and a black cherry consomme. Evan Cruz, Executive Chef, Vista Valley Country Club. I chose the essence plate by Renee Osorio for its clean, crisp lines and its elegant finish. Poached pork belly, which has been crisped, tangerine lace, forged onion flowers, and mandarin orange. Now time to talk more about these beautiful new patterns. Here to do that, District Sales Manager Alina Makaricheva. Alina, thank you so much for coming to talk about these gorgeous collections. Uh, what really excites you about these new products? I'm very happy to be here. By the way, can I just say how impressed I am that you were able to pronounce my last name? Oh, thank you. I did practice it about 15 times. <laughs> thank you for that help yesterday. Um, so what really excites me about this two new product lines by Renee Azori is the innovative design and functionality, as well as the fact that it was created with the chef and the operator in mind. The atelier is a bold, gorgeous embossment that leads the eye to the center of the realm, uh, framing the food perfectly and placing emphasis on the cuisine that is being served. The essence is an unembossed version of the atelier with additions of coupe shapes that are elegant yet casual. Casual elegance and how I would describe this Essence line in a few words. Yeah, absolutely. It's simple, it's elegant, it's very classic, very reminiscent of a sophisticated European tabletop. Was that part of the inspiration went, that went into these lines? Yes, absolutely. In my opinion, this pattern, the atelier, is the new generation of banquet china. It is absolutely ideal for banquets, wedding, uh, event spaces, high end resorts, fine dining. I would place it in a more of a casual environment if I wanted to add a little bit sophistication to the entire setting. The beauty of the essence is that it can be virtually placed anywhere. It's a perfect canvas for any type of cuisine. Tell us more about this gorgeous flatware as well. This is the Robert Welch sandstone flatware. Absolutely, so Robert Welch sandstone is the newest addition to our textured flatware collection. Textured flatware is very popular among operators for a couple of reasons. It hides the fingerprints and it helps with the wear and tear. The sandstone is the newest addition to the family. It has a very unique stippled effect that adds ductility to the handles. What I love about it is the design and how it feels in the hand. It's very soft and comfortable. What our customers are gonna love about it is the price point. It's amazing how an 1810 fine flatware pattern like this can also be affordable. Absolutely, wonderful to hear. And we were chatting yest er, yesterday about this Magogo buffet system. I love how you described it. You called it food and beverage furniture. Talk a little bit about this system. Yes. I'm actually excited to talk about Magogo because I'm very design driven myself. Uh, food and beverage furniture is a new, uh, newer category for Steel Light. And I cannot think of a better partner than Magogo. They have a vast experience in food and beverage industry, which allowed them to create a very end user friendly uh, mod modular systems where you can utilize the same components in various ways to create different configurations of the product. When we talk Magoga, saying high functionality, mobility, durability, exceptional quality, design driven, and customization. You can customize these buffet tables by uh, choosing from various colors and finishes, which gives you infinite options for styling. They believe that the presentation of a buffet table is just as important as the food served on that table. One of my personal favorites about them is their sustainable approach. It's one of the first company that went linenless. And honestly, why would you want to cover this beauty? Yeah, it's absolutely gorgeous. Thank you so much for running us through all of that, Alina. We're going to take a look now, more of a sneak peek of what's to come from Agogo. Let's check it out. <laughs>
We got our chefs back in the house right now, Chef Mark Canzanetta and Chef Jamie Simpson. Uh, we want to wrap up the Magogo discussion here a little bit. We were talking yesterday about the power in this system, and you commented about really wanting to kind of hit that. So can you tell us uh, about this? I think this? it's a fantastic system, whether you're doing a buffet line, you're doing an action station for mm -hmm. a party. The 1,500 watts of power in this really gives you a lot to rapidly serve your guests. So whether you're making an omelet, making your, a seafood paella, or whatever you're doing, the power in this is just phenomenal. Awesome. Okay, back to Essence by Renee Azorio. You've played it something gorgeous yes. here for us. Can you tell us about this? It's a blank palette for me. It's like an artist canvas. So it, anything you do on this, the color palette, because it's so blank, but yet it has a gorgeous slight contour to mm -hmm. it, the food is just going to jump off the plate. Yeah, it's gorgeous. Looks like a work of art there. What is this, by the way? That is a chocolate tart with a passion fruit and, and raspberry puree. And of course, some of the chef's garden artisan flowers. Very nice. Very fresh and delicious. Thank Chef you. Mark, thank you. We're going to hop over to Chef Jamie now, who's using the Atelier collection. Chef Jamie, yeah. what's going on here? Yeah, you know, Rene Osario had me at Wabi Sabi. And from then on, he's, he's, he's kept me. Um, this plate specifically, I saw it at NRA two years ago, and um, I'm really excited to see it in, in full production now. We're, we're loving it. I love these plates because for the same reason. I mean, they're, they're just a blank canvas, but there's a lot of texture in them. Um, you know, they're perfect for small portions or multi-format tasting menus, and I love that, um, especially in our approach to food. Yeah, you want to show us what you're, what you're plating here? Yeah, we've got an asparagus dish um, started with a shrimp butter and dry cured caviar. Um, we're finishing on this plate some turnips, just a, a really simple poached turnip on a turnip puree with Vietnamese spinach. Now, this is really a, a beautiful part of the season for us. It's just as simple as it is. Just put it on the plate and don't screw it up. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Well, it's easy when you're working with such gorgeous raw materials there. Yeah. Guys, thank you so much. Again, we're going to come back to you a little bit later, but we do want to check in with our friends in Chicago. Again, Dave, what are you guys in Chicago thinking of the Essence and Atelier collections? Thanks, Sonny. This is a fabulous collection. Chef Jamie is doing some really unbelievable creations on those plates. And, but I'm here now with Tony De La Reyes. Tony, you're the VP of National Accounts for Steelite. Tell me where this goes in a national account, the Essence and the Atelier. Okay, so we've taken all our shapes that we have right now, and we actually took it a step up now. You get your basic plates that are, and everyone uses to put your protein, your starch, and your vegetable. But as, you know, if you take a look now with all the chefs now, they want to be real creative. So they want a real clean palate. And that's why Essence was developed. And if you look at this shape on here, coop shapes, really from end to end, beautiful presentations on here. Now, we've taken this line right now, and from this here, from Essence, right over to Italia. So where you're looking right now is a beautiful embossing on there. Everyone has come up with their own embossings, either it be concentric lines or just any swirls or curls. Something that we're all looking for right now is again, a coupe shape, but neutral presentations on here. Tony, is the, is the idea of mixing coupe shape with embossment, is that a trend that you see continuing on for a while? Well, if you take all the, the, the mixed shapes here, like here, for example, I'll take this now, you know, like your basic rim soup bowl, it's gone, okay? This, I'm not sure I'd call that a basic rim soup bowl. No, it's sort of the shape on here. And so right now, when you apply on here, maybe a, a tasting of the soup, it used to be a big ladle right now, now you just get a tasting. So, you know, your first taste is your eyes. And uh, the Italia really shows in the food presentation. What I love about this particular shape, not only in the embossment, but I like the, the center well. It's small. It's a portion control issue. It's that subtle uh, practicality that's built into all the steel light products, right? Exactly right. But you said it right there, portion control. Back in the days, it used to be just, just put it all out there and they're going to eat it. No, it's not that way now. Every customer right now takes it to the next level and just showing food presentation and everything that goes from there. But the, the particular line on here, the Atelier, it's neutral and it really stands out. 
Yeah, the other thing is everything from Rene Osorio is just fabulous. And it's very subtle and subliminal almost in the design, but there's still a real tactile process going through in the, in the design process. That's correct. Um, most of the products that you see out there is really heavy, thick, clunky chinaware. And then now the operator gets to choose and select something that's going to be a lot nicer, better presentation, lightweight. When you have lightweight products on there, we make this extremely durable with a three-year warranty, but still from there, you have something for presentation and durability. You know what the amazing part is? This product is so durable, but it feels very refined to the touch. This is another one of those products that you really do have to see. And, you know, if you're, anybody's looking for an upscale, refined look that's going to give you that strength, that durability, the hard porcelain does, but still have a really elegant, sexy look, Rene Azorio. Essence and Atelier. Sonny, we're going to toss it back to you. It's a big hit out here, both of them. We'll, we'll find out which one is the favorite, though. Start the voting now. All right, Dave, thank you so much. Steel Light continues to evolve and grow, and the pan pandemic did not slow them down. We have Steel Light President and CEO John Miles back in studio with us again. Some very exciting acquisitions over the past year. John, tell us about them. Yeah, Sonny, you know, we didn't slow down during the pandemic. Um, you know, our strategy was to acquire um, William Edwards in early March 2020, and then the Homer Lachlan China Company, the Hall China Company in late March 2020. And then coming back around to the, the distribution of Magogo, mm -hmm. acquiring that for North America. So it's been really, really exciting. Yeah, so we have on display some amazing William Edwards pieces. Tell us why it was so important to bring this into the Steelite family. Um, William Edwards is very, very unique in that they produce such a beautiful high-end product and they're able to customize the product. Very, very few people in the world are able to do it today at this quality level and it's been an unbelievable great acquisition. You know, the great thing, Sonny, is William Edwards is still with us. Oh, awesome. And and this piece in particular has been a conversation piece. Can you tell us more about this? Yeah, everyone's been asking about it. So it's actually a piece of art done by Jacques Pepin and we they asked us to do it for his foundation. And I look at the piece, I mean, how many people in the world do you think you can do something like that? Very, very few. Just a I'm so proud of it, I can't tell yeah, you. Yeah, absolutely. It's gorgeous stuff, John. Thank you so much. Thanks we so do much. want to hear more about the William Edwards story right now. Let's take a listen. <laughs>
Amber Laughlin China, Fiesta, and Hall China are unique among the world's producers of tableware for their wealth of styles, superior heat retention, ensuring chip resistance, and avoiding metal marking. We have Steelite Senior Product Manager Cami Ricketts back in studio with us, joining in on the conversation. You played a big role, we understand, Cami, in taking over production of Homer Laughlin and Hall. Can you tell us about that experience? You know, Sunny, um, it's not only an honor to acquire such an iconic brand as Homer Laughlin, but it also comes with great responsibility to preserve that brand with mm -hmm. excellence and integrity. So let's take a look. The Homer Laughlin brand is synonymous to the great American diner, both of which are tough and resilient and somehow survive the worst of times. How apropos, considering Steelite acquired the Homer Laughlin brand just as the world was shutting down last spring. And while the world was on pause, our work with the factory to develop the body, shapes, and patterns was just beginning. First and foremost, we needed to replicate each shape to exacting standards, starting with a clay formulation that contains added alumina, which gives the product its strength and durability. From there, we set out to develop the 600 SKUs that we now offer, which include over 300 shapes spanning over 30 decorative patterns. To say this was a massive undertaking for any factory to be able to successfully execute in one year's time is certainly an understatement. It's taken daily communication with our factory, hours upon hours of documenting, testing, and reviewing samples to make sure each shape matches up to the original. With the end result, being able to continue servicing dedicated Homer Laughlin customers with a seamless transition. Likewise, Steelite took the Hall China offering to our factory partner Anfora and went through the same stringent processes of replicating over 250 bake and serve accessories, including the popular foundry pattern, which boasts a satin matte black textured finish. By taking over the Homer Laughlin and Hall branded lines, the factory in Newell, West Virginia, now known as Fiesta Tableware Company, has been able to maintain American jobs with the production of their iconic, brightly colored Fiesta ware. Fiesta Tableware really is the only remaining factory of its kind in the U.S., and Steelite is proud to partner and support the business by being the exclusive distributors of Fiesta ware and commercial food service. All right, now time to check back in with our bar masters, Tony and Greg, who are here in Youngstown, and Julia, who's in Chicago. Now, Julia, we saw you start making that Ramos Gin Fizz. How is that going? Tell us about your favorite characteristics of that drink. Absolutely. You know, what I love about the Ramos starts off with the build itself. It has so many little bits and pieces coming together. Lime juice, lemon juice together, the fruitiness of the lemon, the tartness of the lime, and then the round, incredibly fluffy quality of egg white and heavy cream, the little bit of sparkling water to finish it off. It truly is one of the most decadent yet still refreshing cocktails that I know. And I'm so excited to be starting to shake some up in just a little bit with my friends, Chris and Tony. How are you guys doing? We are fantastic, yeah. and Julia, your description of the Ramos Gin Fizz made my mouth water. Um, <laughs> I, I'm, I'm thirsty. I don't know. I'm Greg, ready. Yeah, I'm ready. So I'm going to walk you through my recipe. Now, this is a pretty much a take on the classic recipe dating back to 1888 and Henry Ramos. It starts with the white of one egg. So I always want to start with the egg first, just in case I make a mistake, which rarely happens, but occasionally, uh, uh, I don't waste the whole drink. So one egg white, to that we're gonna add one ounce of heavy cream. We're using the modern mixologist Steel Light two-sided jigger to get a proper pour. Now we're gonna add a half an ounce of fresh squeezed hand extracted lime juice. If you know me, you know I'm a stickler on hand extracting my lime juice a la minute. Limes are the most fragile of all citrus. They'll start to oxidize in about 20 minutes. So using our handheld lime squeezer, we're gonna measure out one half ounce of fresh lime juice. Oh, These smells. things are the best. Oh, By the way, thank I, just, you. I don't want to, you know, pump you up too much, <laughs> but this is the best hand juicer. We've got them behind the bar at Ticonderoga Club in Atlanta, and we just, we love using them. Thank you. Yeah, we really ergonomically designed so even the smallest hands can get full extraction. Now we squeeze some fresh lemon juice, a half an ounce of fresh lemon juice. 
One of the key ingredients is the orange flower water. So we've got uh, Fee Brothers orange flower water, two dashes. Now, Stanley Arthur, in his book, Fine Drinks of New Orleans and How to Fix Them, goes around and around with the addition of vanilla extract. I love vanilla extract, so I'm going to add a quarter of a teaspoon of vanilla ex extract straight in there. To balance everything, it's a one-to-one -one simple. So we have one ounce citrus. We're going to add one ounce of simple to balance that. And by simple, obviously, you're simply referring to um, <laughs> equal parts uh, uh, white sugar and hot water, right, until dissolved. Exactly. Uh, it just blends better in cocktails. And I've chosen the Bombay Sapphire. It's a more citrusy, floral-style gin that works beautifully in a Ramus. We're going to add two ponies or two ounces into the 18 ounce brushed stainless steel, tin on tin, modern mixologist shaker set. You know, Tony, I bet you're about to ask me, what are we gonna serve this I in? was about right? to ask you, do you have a glass for <laughs> so us, So right? I've been looking at all of these American 20s uh, from uh, Bormioli Rocco, and whereas they're all unbelievable, and I wouldn't mind drinking a Ramos out of any of them, I think, what do you think? about a nice, tall, kind of uh, a, a juice, long drink style The column glass. style drink that is narrow, that holds onto that beautiful fizz that we add at the end that makes, elevates this drink and really brings it to life, uh, I think is the I perfect choice. Work, yeah, awesome. Now I'm gonna go ahead and just start dry shaking because as Henry Ramos said, the Ramos Gin Fizz, to reach that ropey, beautiful consistency needs to be shaken for 12 to 15 minutes. Well, we've got a lot of work ahead of us, so, and, and there's only two of us, so I'm gonna suggest that we throw it to Sonny while we uh, get some more folks to help us out. Just keep, it, just keep it down over there, guys, okay? We got a show to put on here, just kidding. Okay, thank you so much. Throughout the virtual Steel Light experience, we will be sharing inspiring chef stories with you, starting with Asma Khan's, which doesn't begin like most chefs. She is a Britain-based Indian chef who comes from a royal background and has a law degree and a PhD in British constitutional law. Asma leaned into her real passion, cooking, shortly after obtaining her degree and starting a supper club out of her Kensington home. She attracted a huge following through her her restaurant, Darjeeling Express in London, her cookbook, and her profile on the Netflix series, The Chef's Table. This is Asma Khan. I'm Asma Khan. I'm the founder and director of Darjeeling Express. I grew up in Calcutta, and that is a city in the east of India. I have a cultural mist. My father comes from the north. My mother comes from the east. So I grew up eating, you know, amazing food from two different parts of India. For me, Darjeeling Express didn't start in, the, in Soho or didn't start with the restaurant. Darjeeling Express started on, in my dining room. I called it Darjeeling Express then. It was a supper club. It was called the Darjeeling Express Supper Club. So the journey and the women are the same. What I loved is that I knew this was successful because often that entire table would book to come back next time to be together. We've had incredible friendships that were created around my dining table. This really is the great success of the Summer Club. It wasn't feeding the people, it was building this bridge using food. The connection to Steel Art was really fascinating. I never heard of, of them before. I never looked at plates, you know, this was not something I'd ever want to do because, you know, I had my own stuff at home. When I was opening, when I was thinking of opening the restaurant and I signed the lease, before the final agreement of the lease, I went to Maham because I figured that this is my chance to present my entire culture on a plate. The plate has to look nice, has to be meaningful. It has to be something that I can resonate with, I feel proud of. You know, Maham as a kind of bridge between me and Steelite, Steelite being very responsive, wanting to help, understanding I was a very small independent restaurant, not their usual client, not have mega bucks to spend. Still they spent that kind of time in trying to complete my dream of what I wanted. I really appreciate that. It's a huge difference to actually work with something so big. We were so shocked when we went to the Steelite factory. We couldn't believe it was so big. 
It was just unbelievable. We're thinking, oh my God, our plates are coming from here. You know, everything was shown to us in the color range we wanted. Uh, that's the kind of real, you know, I think a real achievement of any company that is so big that they can make themselves come across as so small. It's a real art. It's an art of customer service, which is a lot of people don't get it. So whenever I've had little kind of, I've had a little tea shop, they send me little cups, you know, green. And I was like, you know, I just love this. They send me green tea cups, you know, and, and, and brown, uh, you know, teapots. I was like, you know, this is just like my house. But because they have lived this experience with me, so if they send you something, it, they get it right. Because there's so many stories. They've been there. They've seen it. They've seen all my family pictures, you know. They might as well have, you know, gone through my mother's cupboard and pulled out stuff. It's that close because they understand exactly what is it that excites me. Bringing a plate of food or, or a dish to the table is actually a very personal thing. It presents your entire brand, your name, who you are, the chefs, the story, all of that. In my case, it is even more complicated. It is even more important how that plate is presented. Because here I'm not trying to get a mission star. I'm not trying to, you know, make my food look like a garden. You know, so I'm just trying to present food with honor and respect. But the colors and the depths and the nuance of the kind of, you know, what my cuisine is, that is what I'm presenting. Then the plate becomes even more important. Not only is Steel Light committed to creating presentation pieces, they're also committed to supporting those who bring you fresh ingredients. Steel Light is proud to have been working with Chef's Garden over the past 18 years. Steel Light President and CEO John Miles shares his thoughts on what makes the Chef's Garden a great partner. I met formerly Jones, the Jones family, and the folks at Chef's Garden nearly 18 years ago. And we became instant friends and have partnered so much over the years. People often ask me how we got together with a guy that grows the best vegetables in the world and became such good friends and how we became such good partners in the industry. It really goes back to the first time I met Farmer Lee Jones. He has the passion that no one else has for what he does. He absolutely gets up every morning enthused to bring people the best products. He cares about the people that he works with. He cares about his customers. And he really has created a movement in our country that where people are thinking about the nutritional value of vegetables again. Lee Jones and his team are truly dynamic, great people in our industry. Why are we such good partners? because so many of the things that he represents, we try to represent in our own business. So how naturally could we not be great partners? A little film about Farmer Lee Jones, the Jones family, and Chef's Garden. I sure hope you enjoy it. You know, one thing's for sure, and that is that things change. Nature changes, and that's really a key. Our goal is to work in harmony with nature rather than trying to outsmart it. Anything that I could do to get to work with Dad was what I wanted to do. He was a vegetable farmer, and he did it quite well. Dad has a saying that the only thing that we're trying to do is get as good as the farmers were 100 years ago. And the vegetables were more nutritious, by 50 to 80% more nutritious 100 years ago than they are today. It's an opportunity for us to look back and learn rebuilding that soil, trying to grow the healthiest, most flavorful vegetables that we knew how. It was a unified vision I'm Farmer Lee Jones from the Chef's Garden. What would I be if I wasn't a farmer? Disappointed.
The history of the farm is certainly a long winding road. Dad had a vision, farming about 1,200 acres of fresh market vegetable in the late 70s, early 80s. And ultimately, we failed. We had a very devastating hailstorm, and it completely and totally wiped out all the crops. And at 19 years old, I stood with my mom and dad, my brother and sister, and they auctioned every single thing off that we owned, right down to my mother's car and our house. The odds were truly stacked against us. But my dad, he was our rock. He was our family's rock. He just never knew defeat. We came back and went to work. As I was growing up, I always thought there was nothing that my dad couldn't do, and that was the attitude that he gave us. And that was really the key to us surviving and thriving. And here we are, growing the healthiest, most nutritious, sexiest, best flavored, best looking vegetables that exist in the world. That's our goal. We felt like we could do more to help society by improving the nutrition of the vegetable. Let's go check out the squash field. You know, the, the stems are great. The leaves are still young enough to eat. The blooms are beautiful. The farm excels when it has somewhere within it the voice of culinary reason. They're wintered over. Well, and of course, and then, you know, the goal of the plant is to produce a mature seed. We're farmers. We understand growing. Chef Jamie brings us a look and a perspective of plants that we had never considered as farmers before. When they start to bloom like this, those little buds eat like, almost like broccoli, you know, or rapini or something. I mean, that is a dish, <laughs> <laughs> you know? The consumer wants to know where their food comes from chefs need to know where they're getting their food from. This place exists for that reason. We normally have about 600 visiting chefs every year. We come to see the farm and know thy farmer and know how something's being grown and who's growing it. We can take these ingredients from the fields and into a, a kitchen. To have good ingredients, great ingredients, is really important. Cooking is easier when your food is great. You just sort of put it on the plate, and you just, you don't screw it up. You can't screw it up. I, I think having great ingredients is critical. Colors for the canvas, or paint for the painter. Farmer Lee has always pushed us. He's always pushed us to try harder, you know, push further, reach, tell a story. We try and convey those messages, you know, that he's telling in the form of a dinner, you know, on the plate. You know, farmers are probably the most optimistic people in the world. Every year, we get another chance. You know, there's an old saying that says, well, maybe next year. And even by the end of the fall, when you're tired and maybe things haven't gone exactly as you planned, and they never do, some years worse than others. We lost dad August 4th. In a lot of ways, we haven't said goodbye. He's here here every every step everything that we do all of our direction all of our goals you know one thing's for sure and that is that things change and either we figure out a way to change with it or you'd fail 
it's the first season without dad. We're at that crossroads and we, we choose to move forward. And we choose to adapt. We choose to survive and thrive. You know, it's kind of like the difference between sustainable agriculture and regenerative. Sustainable means, well, you kind of hang on and you sustain yourself. Regenerative means you're rebuilding. You're rebuilding the people, you're rebuilding the land, you're rebuilding the environment. And Dad always said, if you don't know what the goal is, you'll never reach it. Growing the healthiest, most nutritious, sexiest, best flavored, best looking vegetables that exist in the world. That's our goal. We are thrilled to have Farmer Lee Jones and CEO John Miles back with us here in Youngstown. You put on fresh overalls for us, you That's said. That's right. You're looking yeah. very dapper. Thank um, you. Earlier in the program, we had talked to Chef Jamie about how your produce inspires his dishes. How does he inspire you and all of the people that you work with? Well, you know, it's always a symbiotic relationship when we can have the chef and the farmer working together. Mm -hmm. And to be able to look at a plant in an entirely different way than we do as a production farmer. Mm -hmm. uh, we've learned from chefs that at every single stage of the plant's life it offers something unique to the plate. So it gives you so much more diversity and creativity. But as well, one of the things that's so important in America and throughout the world is reducing waste. And this is so critical to all of us. And so it's really, there's just so many benefits of working directly with a chef and understanding what's possible. Mm -hmm. Very synergistic. Very synergistic. Like. Yeah, yes. that's a perfect um, word. Tell us about your, your working relationship where you guys have partnered for a while. Why is it important to work with Farmer Jones and, and all that he does? Well, I mean, a couple of things. First of all, when, when I met Lee um, 18 years ago or so, you know, and we just started talking about our businesses, it was really clear that we had so many common um, values. Mm -hmm. And, you know, and that's really where the relationship began, you know, with caring about the customer and caring about the product and trying to do a good job every day, caring about the people that we worked with. And, you know, we had that in common. And then out of, you know, kind of a, a common respect, you know, we began to figure out ways to work. If you think about it, Sonny, you know, from an artistic standpoint, we're producing the canvas, mm -hmm. we're producing the frame, we're producing the paint brushes and the utensils. Lee is producing the paint. Mm -hmm. And both of our customers are that artist, that chef. Yeah. And, you know, so we're all, you know, we're all rowing the same way, different products and a different thing, but when it comes together, it's really beautiful. Yeah, I feel like we've seen that throughout the show. People in different parts of the industry coming together to create art, to create things that speak to people in different ways. So very interesting to see it that way. Yeah, and I think that's why this program was so important for us to produce. Um, we've been away from the National Restaurant Show for two years, mm -hmm. and I think that maybe sometimes people forget you know, what draws us all together, you know, learning and the experiences and how much we draw off of each other. And, you know, hopefully we're, we're providing a little slice of that today. Absolutely. Very quickly, let's touch on the regenerative farming that they mentioned in the video. Very interesting practice. Give us the brief description of why that was important to be part of your work. Well, you know, farmers always have felt like their goal in life was to leave the land in better condition for future generations, and that's still really critical. We have a saying that healthy soil, healthy vegetables, healthy people, mm -hmm. healthy environment. And it has to encompass everything, and it's really what John's talking about. I mean, it's so inclusive. I mean, it, it, doesn't, it doesn't surprise me to have a collaboration with John and Steel Light. I mean, they've done more for our family than we could ever repay, and it's those unique relationships. But in regenerative agriculture, it's giving back to the land, but it's also taking care of the people right. and concern huge concern with the environment. Right. So it's so encompassing. Regenerative agriculture, I think, is a far better statement for us than sustainable agriculture. When you think about sustain, it means just to sustain, to hang on. We want to regenerate. We want to create energy and support for the environment and for the people. We want people to want to be excited to come and work on the farms. Absolutely. And to create amazing product for the chefs. I love it. I love seeing this passion come through. We want to mention your book, of course, which is absolutely gorgeous. It's called The Chef's Garden, A Modern Guide to Common and Unusual Vegetables. What do you hope people get from this new book, Farmer Lee? If I had to define it down to one simple word, it would be inspiration. Mm -hmm. 
There's times when we walk by in a grocery store and we're intimidated by a vegetable that we maybe haven't used before. Mm -hmm. And I think that it's just about taking the cuffs off and being not afraid to play. Right. And of course, we use some pretty sexy plates to uh, image it. those <laughs> veggies on too, and that always helps. I think the veggies pop, but they really pop. It's not just canvas, John. I mean, the most creative and the most beautiful plateware in the world. And it's just an honor for our vegetables. I think that, you know, we talked about you and I meeting, but the reality is I think our vegetables and our plates met way before, <laughs> Long we, before did. we did. before we did. That's exactly right. That's that exactly word keeps right. coming up to describe these plates sexy. I agree. They're, they they're, are. they're gorgeous. Well, thank you so much for taking time to explain what you do and about your book. And we do want to mention we are, as a celebration of sorts, giving away several signed copies of this book. So if you want a chance to win that, drop into comments wherever you're watching and Talk about Farmer Lee's signature outfit, and we'll pick the winners at the end of the show. Nice comments only, please, of course, right? All right, we're going to talk with uh, Maeve Webster now about food trends. She is a leading food service consultant with a look first at shareables. So I think the operator needs to consider what the shareable is supposed to be for the patrons and what is the experience the patrons are coming away with. For example, there's one shareable where the dish is a complete dish, and the point is that each member of the party pulls it, you know, a portion out of the shareable. In that case, I think the best solution is to have individual portions that are plated on the same plate or platter that make it very easy for individuals to take their portion without a lot of touching among the individuals. So that portion is complete, it's easy to remove, and then that individual does not touch anybody else's portion. So that's one potential solution. There are also those shareables where the item is meant to be dipped in one or more dip options or sauces. In that case, it's likely that you may want to have the main item in the center that people can use their own utensil to pull out of and then plate separate dip condiment collections at each one of the plates. So rather than have one dish of dips that everybody is dipping into, each member of the party or each member who's participating in the shareable gets their own selection of dips that they are engaging with. And that also limits any kind of cross touching or, or cross um, utilization, which could be a concern because we can't assume that everybody in a party feels equally comfortable with, you know, a very high touch or very collective interactive experience. So the, the final potential solution and again, it all depends on the shareable dish and, of course, what the operator can stand from a complexity back of house and a service complexity issue. But that final potential solution is having some kind of a shareable event that is actually served individually to each person. And here I'm not talking about cutting a cake up and each person gets a slice, but something a bit more interactive, a bit more experiential. Uh, each plate gets their own portion of that shareable event. And uh, it's set up so that everyone is engaging in the event of their own plate. I'm thinking here of a bento box situation or something that needs to be uh, put together by the individual. So rather than having a lot of touching in that case, each individual has the components and then they can build it, but everybody at the table is building the same thing. So it's that shared experience, but it is actually being experienced individually. And now let's talk immersive dining experiences. How do you create an immersive experience? Now, these immersive experiences can be incredibly complex and very technically complicated and, and, um, and really grandiose. Something like if you think about the Van Gogh, the immersive Van Gogh experience that's traveling the country right now, that can be that intense, but obviously that's not realistic for a lot of operators. So how can you make an experience in your operation that is not that um, complete? How do you make any experience in your operation really immersive so that you can help your patrons remove themselves from what's happening outside of your operation, whether it's you know what's going on with the pandemic or what's going on with their lives, because they want to be removed. They want that escape now more than anything else. So immersive experiences need to be full sensory experiences. It can't just be great food. Obviously, great food and great beverages need to be at the core of any experience in your operation. That's a given. But beyond that, you need to think about 
the mood. What is the mood that, that they're supposed to be feeling? How do you control for the mood? What do you want any party? And here I'm not talking about a special occasion party, but any party of patrons that comes in, whether it's one, two, five, or 10, what do you want them to feel when they leave? This is gonna impact the music, the lighting. I mean, most operators understand this, but you need to think about this even more so now because that need for escapism is greater than it ever has been before. Uh, and then of course there's the table settings. And I think prior to the pandemic, it was very easy to just think, well, everything should look nice. And that's about as far as we need to go. But I would suggest now that each table should have its own almost micro sensory experience. Each table should get the same senses and smells, whether they're close to the kitchen or out by the window. Uh, so do you have some kind of uh, setting at the table that has a scent in it, obviously that doesn't con conflict with the food, but that, that does you know help to whet the appetite and does put people in the right mental state? What are the flowers like? What is the tablecloth like? And then of course, what are the serving utensils? How do they feel in the hand? How do they interact with the food? Um, the plating of course is really important and you can't just think, I'm gonna create this beautiful dish and put it on a standard plate because that can take the patron away from that incredibly special, unique dish that you've created, whether it's a food or even a beverage item. So do you need special plates to complement that? If it's, for example, a scallop, uh, do you put that scallop and plate it on a plate that has ripples that look like the ocean so that it's, it's really fully immersing a consumer in what it might be like to eat scallops by the ocean? Um, and, and of course, all of this is going to be based on what the operator can do, uh, you, you know, what makes sense with the servers, but you really need to think through everything. Every detail of a restaurant or a hospitality operation visit needs to be even more carefully and mindfully thought out by the operator than ever before. Consumers have high expectations and can be easily dissatisfied now because they've been at such a low point and their expectations of moving past the pandemic are so great now that that every detail is going to matter. Every detail is incredibly important. The pandemic has been incredibly painful for our industry, but it has opened up an incredible opportunity for innovation. And every operator now has the opportunity to rethink maybe those elements that you haven't been completely satisfied with and finally, the latest trends in outdoor dining. I think first and foremost, any outdoor space needs to be an extension of the brand experience that they will be having indoor. And that is particularly critical for fine dining operators and those operators who have not previously really had any kind of an outdoor alfresco service option. It's very easy to think we'll just set up chairs, we'll just set up tables and, and that's all you need to do. And that's not the case. The outdoor experience shouldn't be an also ran against the indoor experience. Uh, so that's the first thing you need to think about. You also need to consider all of the operational issues. How far is the outdoors from the kitchen? How long of a trek is that? And how will it impact the food and beverage quality? Uh, how many doors do the, the servers need to navigate? Uh, how changeable is the weather? Uh, what is the bug situation on an all overall basis and seasonally? Uh, is it very windy there? Uh, can it be very windy there? And so there, you know, what's the sun like? So you need to take all of that into account to ensure that your patrons remain comfortable, that there's not this sudden emergency where everybody needs to scramble inside and then you don't have enough tables. So you need to take all of this into account to ensure that your outdoor is smooth, it works for your staff, it works for your patrons, and a lot of that comes down to serving wear, how you can carry things in and out, how your plating and the serving wear maintains the integrity and the heat or the proper temperature of those items. So all of that needs to play into that as well. And then of course, finally, you need to think about can you extend that outdoor experience past the typical uh, months and into colder months, whether it's all winter long or at least into the uh, cusp seasons of early spring and late fall. And one thing I would say there is patrons have given the food service industry a pretty wide berth with temporary solutions and, and really rapid responses to a very changeable situation over the last year you know, plus. 
but they're not going to put up with that for much longer. So yes, there were some innovative solutions for the winter and these little greenhouses and whatnot. And in some cases, those will work well. In other cases, they're not gonna cut it long-term. So you need to think about what are those solutions that make sense for your operation that are brand and strategy specific and relevant. And then how, again, if you are moving into those colder months, how is that gonna work for both your servers and your patrons? Now, as Maeve mentioned, dinnerware can enhance the customer's experience indoor or outdoor. And for that, we recommend looking at Steelite's new melamine, Cali by Creations. They look like fine china, but they are virtually indestructible and lightweight. We're getting a closer look right now with National Account Manager Dino Mitzos. Dino, thank you for coming in. Yeah, no problem. Tell us about this gorgeous line, and in particular, this really muted, really cool color palette here. Yeah, so Cali is our, our newest melamine range, and we have a huge portfolio of melamine now. And as you said, you know, melamine is virtually indestructible. Mm -hmm. um, you know, when we first started, um, well, because it's indestructible, it's really good right. for outdoor dining. Yes. And also rooftop dining um, and, and fast casual, high velocity restaurants. Um, but when we were designing melamine, we didn't want it to make it look like traditional melamine. Because when you think of melamine, you kind of think of, you know, cafeteria style dinner plates. And I remember when we first got samples and I would see them in the office and I'd pick them up and I'd be like, wow, this is a cool ceramic piece yeah and, i mean but you it's lift like it a, up and it's so lightweight it's a, it's a fraction mm -hmm. of, of, the, of the weight so um it, it's just you know great for outdoor dining was that a real um interest in designing this to make it look more heavyweight to make it look more durable to make it look like those different absolutely. materials with we, that flexibility yeah we want it to look like just yeah. traditional china yeah it's absolutely beautiful now what makes these work so well in those high volume outdoor well, restaurants you know because it's lightweight obviously you know these outdoor areas you got to travel a far away usually from you know the back of the house in the kitchen right. to to you know to the patron so that's one aspect also we designed cali to be a, a truly stacking line these nest really really well um so you know for for storage mm -hmm. you know it's it's definitely great for the operator as well as these stackable trays we this is our rank tank carrier mm -hmm. and we made these trays that fit in and what we do is we take the, uh, the 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 stack plate and that becomes the lid so it also becomes a covered solution oh, going cool. from the back of the house and traveling this far distances awesome thank you so much now in addition to the melamine dinnerware we also have a new collection of unbreakable drinkware called aspen everclear let's take a look How fun was it making that video? Oh, <laughs> yeah, it was a blast. Yeah, so vir when you say virtually indestructible, yeah. you mean it. Yeah, so um, the Aspen Everclear, it's a, um, a polycrystal product. Mm -hmm. You know, it looks and feels like glassware and the clarity's there. Um, and like you saw, it's virtually indestructible. I mean, I didn't know what was gonna happen when I hit that thing, but it, it probably threw, flew uh, 50 yards and the competitive product it exploded on impact. Sure, and no, did you notice any chips or any? I mean, was it, it was fairly like, durable? It was, you know, a minor scratch, basically, a minor dent. So, I mean, give it a whack on the table. I, mean, <laughs> I need to bring these home with my kids. I'll yeah. tell you how indestructible yeah. they are. Very cool. Yeah. Thank you so yeah, much. You're welcome. Appreciate it. Speaking of glassware, you think those Ramos gin fizzes are ready yet? We're going to check in with Tony, Greg, and Julia. I hear shaking, which means progress. How are we doing, guys? Sonny, we've been shaking for what feels like 57 and a half minutes right now. I think we're almost there. Uh, but to be honest with you, Tony is getting older, and I think, I think we need help. Thank you, Greg. <laughs> well, even Henry Ramos said that the drink should be shaken between 12 and 15 minutes, and he would often have 20 to 35 shaker boys behind the bar shaking. So, I am getting a little older and I think we need a little help, so I've enlisted some friends to help us shake. 
Hi, how are you? Come on in. Yeah, come on yeah, down. Got some shakers for you. There we go. Just walk right in. Thank you so much for your help. There's no wrong way to we shake it. I promise you a, a, a tasty drink. If we can squeeze all the way in. <laughs> like our friends, uh, Francesco LaFranconi says, shake it, don't fake it. Right. Julia, how's things going in Chicago right now? They're looking really good. I have a whole team behind me helping to shake these bamoses. My ice is just about gone and the tin is super frosty, so I'm excited to strain this off very soon. You'll be drinking them after, for sure. Gin it's just about ready. Thirsty people. Oh, yeah. Uh, it's feeling good. It's feeling good. You know, Greg, people often ask me, you know, what is the proper way to shake a drink? And I always quote the, the great Harry Craddock from the Savoy Cocktail book, 1930, when asked the proper way to shake a drink, he said, you want to shake the shaker as hard as you can. You want to wake the drink up, not rock it to sleep. And mine I, is wide awake, too. Mine is wide awake <laughs> as well. Let's get it in the glass, shall we? Yeah, so we are going to go ahead and utilize this uh, beautiful American 20s uh, Bormelli Rocco Collins style glass. The fluted texture uh, uh, in the interior of this glass is really going to make for a spectacular addition to what Tony is about to uh, elaborate on, which is the importance of a chilled bubble component to this drink. Absolutely. When asked, you know, to describe this drink, I, I say it's, it's like drinking a flower. It's like drinking a cloud. It should be light and fluffy and fizzy. So mm -hmm. great soda water, be it a highball, a vodka and soda, or a Ramus gin fizz. Great carbonation is the key. Make sure you use small cans or bottles. Ice cold, also a key. And just, oh, it's going to tickle the palate. So Sonny, back to you while we let this settle down a little bit. Oh, I cannot wait to visit your corner of the studio again, guys. Thank you so much. Let's continue this live virtual Steel Light experience with a Steel Light performance range that you know and love, featuring Craft, Bead, Aurora, and Revolution, all seen here with their respective new colorways. Now you'll hear from the man who designed them, Andrew Flamecki, and what's behind his inspiration for Aurora. This new range is called Aurora. It's a new range in that we've combined two reactive glazes together in different sorts of combinations. I'm Andrew Klemetsky, uh, VP of Design for Steelette International. Each piece will be unique because it's supplied by hand and there's a lot of reactivity within the glaze and then using that in combination just increases that variability. So each piece is unique and individual and it's as unique and individual as the person that, that decorated it. There's huge interest in colour. This has been with us for some time and we've been providing you know, coloured glazes to the market for quite some time now. This just takes this to another level because we're not just putting one glaze on a piece, we're putting a couple of glazes. And that just adds to the uh, variety and richness. It also means that these glazes are backwards compatible so you can slot them in almost as an extension to the range. They give a richness in terms of tonality and difference in colour hue. This range has been developed to be useful in lots of different areas with lots of different cuisines, not specific to any type of cuisine whatsoever. So the name Aurora came about because when we were using these glazes in combination, we noticed that there was a beautiful curtaining effect with one glaze overlapping the other. And this very much reminded us of the Aura Borealis, uh, the Northern Lights. Okay, we're back in the kitchen area, joined now by Senior VP of Sales, Kent Wilson, Chef Jamie Simpson. Chef Jamie, what do you think about the new Aurora? You know, I haven't seen it yet until today, but I find it as versatile as, um, you know, as anything. Uh, we plated a dish today with duck liver and, 
and cake, right? Oh, and wait, what? Yeah, yeah. And we call Those don't seem like they go together, but. Exactly. It's like sort of riding the line between sweet and savory. That's exactly what this plate line is, is, is doing for me. You know, it's, it's somewhere in between. It's very ambidextrous. It can live in, in many worlds. It's got many colors, and I love the direction it's taken. Do you take into account when you're plating something or choosing a presentation, like the feel, the texture, the, talk about that and, and why these plates sort of fill that? Out of 10 times, yeah, yeah 100%. You know, if we're looking for something really formal and, and elegant and clean and white, you know, we go there. Mm -hmm. um, if we're looking for something more organic, misshapen, mm -hmm. you know, we, we go there. Matte makes a huge difference. Yeah. Um, well, it looks beautiful. Thank, Thank you, so, you so, much. so much. Kent, we're going to switch over to you. Um, what are you hearing from customers about this line? I'm hearing from customers, finally. <laughs> finally, Stila has been able to come out with a product, the Aurora Collection, where we have glazed both sides of the serving vessel. So both on the Aurora Vesuvius, which I'm holding now, and on the Aurora Revolution, which I'm holding now, we've got glazes inside and out. For a, a factory like ours, that is known for high quality, high durability pin firing. This has been a monumental change for us. Andrew Klemecki's done a great job in the design of the Aura Revolution and the Aura Vesuvius, and mm -hmm. our customers are ready for this. That's They've been asking good. for it, and it's exciting to have. Awesome, show us the rest of the collection which we have set up right here to your left. So you've got uh, four different colors in the Vesuvius range. You've got three different colors in the Revolution range. Rose quartz is just absolutely gorgeous some jades, so you've, you've kind of got something for every customer out there. It can mix and match, or it can be a standalone collection, mm -hmm. whatever the, the chef or the operator chooses to do. Awesome, okay, we're gonna take a walk down this way, featuring now two new colorways in the craft collection. We have apple, we have raspberry. Talk to us about what we're seeing here, Ken. Well, what we're seeing here with the craft is we're celebrating its 10th anniversary. It's been an absolutely fantastic product for us. It's really, uh, changed our, uh, our perception of the marketplace entirely. Uh, and we're launching two new colors this year, the Kraft Raspberry, which you see here, and the, uh, the Kraft Apple. Um, when, at first, when we saw the Kraft Apple, it was a little challenging for me to get over, but then I really? saw... Really? Uh, that was one I was drawn to immediately when I, I came over I, here. It's so vibrant. No, well, it is vibrant, yeah. but it really comes to life when you plate it. Yeah, it sure does. And that, that's what I like to do is look at, get a great chef like Mark, yeah. get his creations on there, and boom, that's what really makes a plate a plate. Yes, brings it to life. Okay, perfect transition. We're gonna talk with Chef Mark again, and you mentioned in particular, you've plated some beautiful things sure. here on both apple and raspberry, but you said the same thing. This design in particular, that colorway in particular, was really appealing to you. I was immediately you. attracted yeah, to it same. because it took me to an era, a time, hearkening to a back time, my grandma's house. You know, and those colors, we walked into, everybody had those colors but now it's almost like the steel light designed this for bistro in 1907 because we have chartreuse banquettes but the way the food just pops off the plate the little inaccuracies in the design not inaccuracies but the little pebbles in the design it just brings food to life i mean the glazing everything about it it was meant for food yeah tell us about when you're using a more vibrant product like this what you tend to do with with presentation and things does it inspire a new way of plating and of cooking the for you the plateware inspires the direction of my culinary interesting beliefs. it really does okay. it inspires me to create something that is specifically meant for that dish mm -hmm. that plate let's talk about raspberry here which you have plated with a beautiful what is this does that, it, it's, it's just so a good. simple tart with a chocolate okay. cream and a, and a vanilla cream and then of course some pomegranates and of course you know lee jones farmer lee jones with his amazing little micro flowers over there, just amazing stuff. So um, all of John's plates, all of Steel Light's plates since the time I met him have inspired me to be a better chef. That's really cool. Yes. I love to hear that. I'm calling dibs on that for Okay, you should call okay, dibs. So just set that aside. <laughs> okay, thanks, Chef Mark. Another product line on display here today in Youngstown is bead. This classic and timeless look of bead provides a beautiful frame for your food. Here's how it can raise the perception of food proportion as well. My name is Mikhail Anthony. I'm the executive chef of Chef's Rolls Test Kitchen. I chose the plate bead wash truffle by Steel Light because not only is it gorgeous, but versatile and the perfect vessel for my dish. This is blood orange cured scallops with a citrus and stone fruit salad and a mango nectar nuakmam. 
If you're looking for a new dinnerware option that's more on the casual and playful side, then Steelite's newest product, Revolution Edge, is an exciting option. Dave Turner standing by in Chicago live right now to show off the Revolution Edge features. Tell us all about it, Dave. Thank you, Sonny. It's great to be back here in Chicago, and I'm with Armando Monteroso. And Armando, you are an expert in food and beverage, and particularly in the operational area. This is the new Revolution Edge from Steelite. What do you think of this product? I think it's great. You know, it, it uh, really frames food really well. And, and what I love, it evolves. It, it allows you to add to the Revolution line and really build on that. Um, you, you don't have to throw your pattern away and get a whole new pattern. But Well, you just queued me up right to get the revolutionary bowl, Revolution Bowl out here. I love this bowl, don't you? Sure, it's fantastic. And the, the colors are nice and subtle. I mean, it really allows the food to pop. And, and, and who doesn't like a nice coupe like bowl like that? Now, this is on their high aluminum body. How does that hold up for you? Which is great. I mean, you, you can't, you can't, beat the the warranties and the durability the stackability um it just performs extremely well yeah. steel light's known for their durability and stackability and really their overall practicality right sure oh absolutely um this is something that'll last a long time um and and, and that's as operators we, we have to think about um yeah. you're a big fan not only of steel light but their own their own buffet line called magogo right sure. yeah i've, I've uh, used magogo quite a bit uh you know i love the versatility but i think most importantly i love the intuitiveness of it all so um the designers are also operators, right? So they understand how, uh, what we need and how to build it. So it's, it's useful. It's super practical. Um, parts are interchangeable um, and you can really use one set to create different scenarios throughout your operation. Yeah, that's the one thing I love about Steelite. Steelite and Andrew Komecki, their designer, he talks about backward engineering things a lot. And particularly, you see that in Edge going all the way back through some of the other colors. It mixes so well, the Revolution, uh, uh, the line itself, the basic one. And now even Magogo, same kind of thing. Sure, yeah, I know it's evolved. Um, I think the new the new table top covers, the, the, the lids, the, uh, the, the different patterns, the different textures, it, it's really evolved tremendously over the years. And, you know, we've implemented those in a lot of the hotels I've recently been at, um, and, and they perform great. Beautiful products that work in hotels. Sonny, we're back to you in Youngstown. The products out here are an absolute hit. Yeah, I'll just... All right, guys, thank you so much. Steelite is proud to highlight another new collection. This one coming in July of 2021, Nordic Coupes and Stack Plates. They pair perfectly with the Steelite Performance Taste Collection. So back more to talk about that is Senior VP of Sales, Kent Wilson. Kent, what's the initial reaction to this line been like? Well, the initial reaction has been tremendous. Um, it's inspired others to think of different ways of creating uh, new dinnerware with a very simplistic palette very simplistic coupe, very simplistic stack tray. Mm -hmm. It might seem you know, pedestrian, but in reality, it's got a number of different uses. Um, and a canvas like this, this is something that Andrew is going to be able to create his next um, generation of different mm -hmm. glazes to make it really come to life. Yes. So it can be just a simple collection that'll go with our existing taste and simplicity ranges. And I'm sure in the future, Andrew's gonna come up with something wonderful to decorate it with. Very chic and simple and elegant. Thank you so Very much, chic. Kent. And here's Thank more you. on the Nordic collection from designer Andrew Klemecki. So we've developed a new uh, coupe shape that um, is, is very much influenced by Scandinavian design. And it's designed really to really showcase new glaze applications, uh, lots of different types of print application as well. Um, and it also works extremely well aesthetically as a plain white shape to best showcase what, what Chef wants to do with it. From one side of the world to the other, for over 70 years and three generations, Robert Gordon Australia has been making quality pottery. The brand stands for craftsmanship and creativity, and it's been built around the importance of its heritage. Robert Gordon pieces are created with a strong focus on innovation and design with an Australian aesthetic. Regional sales manager David Turco joining us here live in studio to tell us more. This is a very diverse collection. Tell us more about it, David. Well, sure, Sonny. I have to tell you, Robert Gordon is one of my favorite collections. Just that look and feel of the pottery, mm -hmm. along with the unique shapes, really makes Robert Gordon inviting and versatile. Uh, it has such a cool, smooth color palette with its three colors, uh, pure, shell, and storm. Uh, it also, the glaze really brings the product to life. 
Yeah, it really adds another dimension to it. And I love it, the interplay of, of the color on the rim here, especially in these small um, It's a, It's a gorgeous glasses. product. Uh, we have some products here that we wanted to just introduce quickly. We have our organic shapes, which mm -hmm. is more of that free-flowing, thinner, light, lightweight body product. We have our stacking bowls and trays, mm -hmm. which, as you can see, fits perfectly in a rank tank carrier. That's great for those shareable dishes. And as you can see, we have just a beautiful assortment for our coffee service. What venues are you seeing this in right now? Well, Robert Gordon is so unique, it really can be used in any venue. Uh, we are seeing it a lot in that casual to high-end dining. Mm -hmm. I'm sure you'll probably find it in your local tavern too. Uh, but the Robert Gordon collection in a whole is priced at such an affordable price point that is really makes it available for everyone out in the marketplace. Well, it's absolutely beautiful. Thank you Thank for you. coming in and speaking to us about it. Now, Robert Gordon, along with the other Steelite products, are often paired up next to versatile banquet and buffets like this D.W. Haber fusion system you're about to see. Around this time in 2019, Steelite acquired D.W. Haber and has successfully brought it to customers around the globe. And now we are talking with Dave Haber, Executive VP of DW Haber Buffet Equipment. Dave, we know this partnership wouldn't have been so successful were you not so closely involved with it. So tell us about all the work and passion that went into these pieces. Well, um, as you can see from the video they just showed, the, the Fusion Buffet system, which is really the most versatile mm -hmm. uh, system on the market, um, it was actually designed around our induction range. So we were looking to do elevations for induction um, so you can do actually cooking and holding for shaving dishes at different elevations. And we wanted to make it very versatile. So we built in grills so you could use sterno for outdoor cooking. And then we wanted to do the cold. So we brought in our cold fusion bowl so you could switch from hot to cold. Mm -hmm. Then we brought in all these different tiles to create different looks between the resin, between the white and the black marble look. We have glass for clear glass, black glass, as well as teak. Tiles. Yeah, I was going to ask you about these particular materials. This is beautiful. Talk a little bit more about when it, what went into this piece in particular. Well, so a couple of different things here. So this is um, part of our Kenny Mac uh, mm -hmm. resin collection. So these are very unique bowls that are bring a whole new level to color and finishes that you don't see in a lot of other things we do. Um, as far as the shelves, these are a little bit different. So we added fiberglass to the resin to make it really strong so we can make a thinner shelf durable that you can put a lot of weight on, and then that fits in between all the different risers and stuff. Um, what's, what's really cool about the teak itself, this is really exciting, so this has got a great sustainability story mm -hmm. that is quite unique where we're sourcing the teak from mills where they're manufacturing uh, furniture, outdoor furniture, and so we're taking all the scrap lumber that, that can't be used for the furniture. So we're able to build this really high-end, heavy-duty, uh, practically indestructible wood riser system um, at a third of the price of what it would cost to do regular teak. Oh, that's awesome. So and the added sustainability factor is awesome. And the sustainability factor is very exciting. That's important to our hotel partners. 
Absolutely. And it is becoming the biggest part of our product range. Can, can you tell us what made Steelite such a natural partner for your company, which is over 100 years old? Yeah, you know, so it's interesting. John and I have known each other for, you know, our whole careers, and we've always had this mutual respect for our brands. But we never really realized, I guess, over the years how similar we are. Um, you know, John has a lifetime chip warranty on all of their plates, and DW Haber has always had a lifetime warranty on our all of our banquet equipment. Mm -hmm. um, so when we talked about merging the companies, you know, I didn't realize how similar we are. And you know, and it's not just about you know getting customers, but building fans. And I saw that's how Steelite was, and that's how we were. So it was really just a great fit. Yeah, well, you're making absolutely beautiful things. Thank you so much for Thank coming you. into the studio and Thank talking you. about it. And Dave, we understand you also teamed up with Magogo on some product development, right? Specifically, their new freestanding V-Shield system. So the Magogo V-Shield system addresses the safety function without sacrificing aesthetics. Here is an in-depth look at the system's capabilities. The Magogo V-Shield is the most exciting breakthrough in portable breath guard systems. The first joint development project with Steelite, DW Haber, and Magogo the Steelite exclusive system is available worldwide. This unique system utilizes Magogo magnetic technology to easily secure the shields together with two sides narrow and wide shields to accommodate any configuration. There are also side panels available to easily attach and close off the ends of any size table setting for added safety. The upscale contemporary design can be joined together as long as you can imagine with corner panel additions to allow for 90 degree turns or gentle curves to safely enclose any curve or angle your setup may have. The extra thick durable plexiglass is easily removable and can be switched between our full length closed panel or our pass through serving gap panel to customize your safe, efficient guest experience. As you can see, with just a few key design elements, the portable V-Shield system gives the look of a completely custom designed, upscale, built-in safety breath guard display. For unparalleled quality, durability, and functionality at an affordable price point, contact your Steelite representative for more info on the Magogo V-Shield. And we continue now with another inspiring story out of Las Vegas. Elizabeth Blau is widely credited with transforming Las Vegas into the world-class culinary destination it is today. Her work with Steelite is just the tip of the iceberg when it comes to serving our community and our industry. Anyone who knows me knows how much I love the hospitality industry, an industry I've spent my whole life really in. When I think about the modern hospitality industry, the industry that we all participate in every day, it's almost impossible to not think about Elizabeth Blau. Someone who pioneered Las Vegas, someone who pioneered so many incredible restaurants, so many incredible concepts. When I think about Elizabeth, I think about all the people that she's helped, all the restaurants that she's helped to start, all those people throughout our industry that are strung together by her and the relationships that she's built with them over the years. The modern hospitality industry, think about that, someone that has been so impactful and so meaningful to the business. When I think about Elizabeth Blau, I also think about how she's given back to our industry and how much she's tried to help other people. I think about her telling me the first dinner I had with her that in this world and in this industry, you don't get very far on your own. I hope you enjoy this film about Elizabeth Blau and all the wonderful things that she's doing. She's always got such a great positive perspective on our industry and boy, we would not know what to do without her. You know, our business of hospitality is really so all-encompassing. We're all working together to provide a really extraordinary experience for our guests. I'm Elizabeth Blau. I'm a mom, restaurateur, entrepreneur, jack of all trades, coming to Las Vegas. One of my least favorite questions ever is what it's like to be a woman in the industry. And for many years, I would say, I have no idea because I'm only a woman. I don't know what it would be like to, to be a man. The reality is, is that while over 50% of people attending culinary and hotel schools now are women, less than 7% statistically will ever make it to restaurant owner or executive chef. Those numbers are staggering. 
And while there are national organizations that support and promote women, for me, it's not moving fast enough. And so we decided to form a women's hospitality initiative. We launched our event, and really less than, than two weeks later, the pandemic hit and, and really shut the entire world down. In Las Vegas, you know, we've experienced utter financial crisis, but those were days. Those were potentially weeks. The pandemic brought something to a new level, the absolute shutdown of this city. Community centers, senior centers, schools all being shut down. And so none of the normal channels of distributing food to people could be followed. People were afraid to leave their home. We knew food insecurity was going to be at an unreal level. And so we founded a novel system called Delivering with Dignity. Take restaurant quality food and deliver it directly to the doorsteps of those most vulnerable in the community. We ended up working with 47 nonprofits. To date, we've gotten about 375,000 meals delivered directly to the doorstep. In this time of, of need, you know, food does always provide happiness and joy and sustenance for people. We really wanted to make sure that these were meals that were cooked with love by chefs and, and that they were nutritious and balanced meals that, that somebody really cared about. We just hope that the meals that we provided were just a little hope and, and sunshine for people in a really dark time. We are so fortunate here in, in Las Vegas that business is coming back, and we are really seeing that, that people are so excited to see friends and relatives and, and to get out and socialize again. While we were able to make sure that people are fed, people in need, I think something gets lost in translation when you, know, you put beautiful restaurant food into cardboard, styrofoam, plastic containers. You know, there's that beauty of the experience of interacting with the service team, of having a cocktail or a glass of wine. You know, our business of hospitality is really so all-encompassing. It just starts with a warm greeting and really just transcends into great food, great service, and hopefully an escape uh, just for a few hours. Elizabeth, hi, how are you? Hi, John, so nice to see you. It is so fantastic to see you too. Congratulations on all that you've accomplished during the pandemic. It's been such a tough time for us all and it's, it's amazing to, to see everything that you and your team have accomplished. Thank you. It's uh, <clears throat> definitely been a year like none other, but uh, they did such a beautiful job with that video, so thank you. Yeah, no, it's really incredible and, and you know, as you, as you know, and all my friends know, you've always been an inspiration. And I think the video tells such a great story about you and the whole team and everything that you've done out there. It's, it's really, really amazing. Thank you. So, so I guess Las Vegas is 10 days away from reopening completely. Is that, is that right? I mean, the official date is June 1st, but uh, John, I can tell you if you were on the Strip this weekend, um, you would have thought that things were, were already back. So um, consumer confidence is back. People are out there eating and drinking. The weather has just been magnificent here. So the hotels have been you know, pretty close to high 90s in terms of occupancy. So, um, so I'd say we're back here in Vegas. Boy, I have to tell you, you know, outside of, of talking about all the, the wonderful things that you've done for, for the community there in the industry, I think people just getting a perspective on how things are coming back in Las Vegas was, was really important. And, and boy, I tell you, that's just fantastic news. You know, uh, this weekend, uh, I was out running errands and 
you know, just not putting a mask on everywhere you go and, and you know, just seeing people kind of relaxed. I mean, there's like a, a visceral feeling in the air here that, um, that things are, are different. And, you know, I think that optimism and, and hope is back because, you know, especially I don't need to tell you that um, our restaurant industry was probably one of the absolute hardest hit and you know there's thousands and thousands of restaurants that will never reopen across the country and thousands of jobs that um are, are never coming back i mean people i think have reevaluated, and a tremendous number of people have have left our industry um hopefully not for good but you know once we got through the pandemic and the crisis and uh and the financial aid from the government now, you know, we, we have a new looming crisis because we just literally cannot find enough people um, to staff these these restaurants, whether it's, you know, chefs or restaurant executives down to the line level positions, um, certainly prep cooks and dishwashers. And so just when we breathe this fresh air, you know, and of hope and optimism and many restaurants just can't open. Uh, they can't open their patios. They can't open to full occupancy because um, they literally cannot staff. Yeah, and we're seeing it everywhere in the country. And hopefully we, we reach some type of equilibrium over the next few months where people start to come back and, and we, we see that situation improving for sure. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I can't thank you enough for being here. Congratulations to you and your team. I can't wait to see you and your family in person. Um, Congratulations to you and your team for all you've accomplished. And thank you so much for being with us, Elizabeth. You're a real inspiration to everyone. Well, you know, Steel Aid has been a great partner for us for, for more than uh, than 20 years. And, you know, the, the products, your expanding line, um, you know, you are, you know, just a, a go-to for us in terms of, of quality, integrity of the, of the product. So, uh, on behalf of all of Blau and Associates, um, thank you. And can't wait till we can be back in Chicago or, or some other places. Um, I, it's just, you know, kind of unfathomable that we're not walking the show and um, thinking of some great restaurant to go out for dinner with you and the Steel Light team. So fingers crossed that that's sooner rather than later. Absolutely. Thank you again so much for being with us. Thanks, Elizabeth. Say hi to everyone for us. In Folks, back over to the bar. All right, this is a place to be over here, John. I'm back with Tony and Greg. Made it to my final destination of the day, guys. I, I hear, speaking of Vegas, there's a little backstory on that city with how you all met. It's true, That's actually. Right. Yeah, the first time I ever met Tony was uh, sitting uh, at a bar that he was uh, manning. Um, and he made a drink, which actually puts in my head something we can talk about here in a minute. But um, yeah, the, it, it's uh, it's just been a testament to you know the industry and, and the and the, the pathways and all the little streams that run together into one big river. And the fact that we're here now, almost 25 years later, is is just incredible. But. It's been a joy. Yeah, absolutely. I know that you guys are going to talk about a giveaway shortly of some of the items that we're seeing here, but we're about to talk about the mixing and matching capabilities. You, you've been using their line. You've had your hands on these glasses and all of the rest of the spar set for a while. Tell us about what you appreciate about the mixing and matching potential with all these items. Well, I had the great opportunity to partner with John Miles and Steelite when I was designing the Modern Mixologist line of bar tools, and, and John saw the need in the industry for a professional line of tools designed by a bartender, designed to work together at affordable price point because there really was a, a lack of good quality professional tools available. So it's been a fantastic um, joint partnership working with Steelite and continuing to develop new uh, line extensions and all the great tools that we're using today and I believe. And, well, actually, you know what I love about that and the bar tools is, so Steelite is known, of course, for its tabletops, right? And, and what we consider the bar tops and the sheer breadth to your point of the mixing and matching, not just the tools, right? But they thread right into an unbelievable bevy of glassware, mm -hmm. right? And uh, so for myself as an operator, uh, the, there's no greater joy than assembling your own treasure chest of all the different choice pieces from, you know, the Rona line, from the Bormio Roca line. It's a, it's a great joy. And I, I think, um, uh, there's a, I believe there's a, there's a video, right? That'll there show is a us video, but I really want to have a sip that. of this drink. You gotta get out of here. Can we do that? Yeah. Okay, wait, cheers. Soon. We're cheers. gonna yeah. toast, you're gonna go take a seat. Okay. <laughs> Let's talk about more mixing and matching with Steelite. Well, we cheers. <laughs> cheers.
So what do you think? Oh my gosh, it's amazing. It's delicious. Mm -hmm. You said it was an adult milkshake. Yeah, like, basically. Yeah. It's very light. It's very. It's got a little edge of sweetness to it. I love it. Good, good. Well, um, though we love having you behind the bar, it's, <laughs> crowding it's your space. It's time for us to do some work and for you to relax. I'll take so my why notes. Don't you sit on the other side. I will. Thank you, gentlemen. We'll <laughs> Thank see you, you soon. Tony. Thanks, Sunny. Uh, that is yummy. Yeah, I'm going to take one last sip. And Me too. Then I'm going to bring up that drink we talked about. Mm -hmm. So, yummy. Tony, the first beverage you ever made for me in Vegas all those eons ago was an Aperol Spritz. And Good at memory. the time, you were known as Mr. Aperol Spritz in the entire city of Las Vegas. So somebody said, hey, do you know Tony Aperol Spritz before you could even finish what you were saying? And so I think that kind of dovetails beautifully into the Spritz, right? A absolutely. And at that time, I was probably a little ahead of the game on the Aperol Spritz. You're the way ahead of the game. About about 10 years ago. Yeah, I, I love aperitivos. I love that whole concept of the aperitif, the aperitivo hour, and the Aperol Spritz is the perfect aperitif that end of the day when friends get together to have a couple of low ABV drinks, a few bites, spend an hour, good conversation, hug, kiss, and then they go on their way. Um, but the Aperol Spritz, perhaps the finest, and Spritz, again, keeping in our theme of simple, one, two, three, I'm going to use this beautiful, uh, that's the 20s. That's beautiful Amer American 20s, yeah. American 20s from Bromerolia. That's a beautiful vessel for a spritz. Now, a spritz is a drink that we're actually going to build in the glass itself. So if you'd ice that up for me, I'd I just to. want to talk a little bit about the history behind spritzes. Spritzes date back to the late 1800s when uh, the Austrians controlled what is known as the Ventanon today. The, and they, would, they had a little trouble with the northern Italian wines. They were a little too strong for them. So to stretch the alcohol, they would add a spritz of water, which became a spritz of carbonated water. And in turn, a spritz today is some type of a bitter liqueur, some type of a sparkling wine, like a Prosecco, and then a spritz of soda. So I go by the old recipe of three, two, one. But I'm going to start with the Aperol. The Italians would get mad at me because they say to start with Prosecco. But the reason I start with the Aperol is I want to get it really cold first. So two parts of the Aperol, or two ounces, going right into the glass. Now I'm going to use the uh, modern mixologist 24 degree twisted bar spoon just to get that nice and cold. Ah. Listen to that. I love, the, I love the ridges in the inside of the glass. Well, they were talking earlier about the sexy plates. Um, I think glassware is so sexy. It probably sounds like something's exploding on your end of the camera, y'all, but it sounds really good behind the bar. So we got that nice and cold. You put a few more ice cubes Absolutely. in there um, and make sure everything is really cold. And we're going to use some Prosecco to spritz it up. Um, and this is the, uh, a road map, if you will, the three, two, one. If you like a little more Aperol, add a little more Aperol. But we have two parts Aperol to three parts Prosecco. All right. Oh. Tony, actually, you just made a really important point, and I think something that all of our viewers should, should take away. Cocktails, in general, start with recipes, right? But recipes are fundamentally uh, informed by your tongue 
and your nose and your eyes. So know that there's always a little flexibility there. Know that you can dial one or the other ingredients up and down accordingly if it works for you. Absolutely. And my mom, God rest her soul, she was a big Irish woman, my mom. And she always said, Tony, never trust a skinny chef. Yeah, you have to taste everything. That's right. Uh, That's and, right. and it goes for drinking, too. You're going to drink it. You're going to enjoy it. You should have it the way you like it. Uh, the final step is the spritz. Uh, in German, a splash. Uh, in Austrian, to spray. And it's just one part of ice cold soda. And make sure when you stir this, I have a rule. Carbonated drinks, spare the spoon, save the bubble. So just enough to incorporate all of those ingredients. A freshly cut slice of orange. If we were in Venice, we would add a green olive and have it Venetian style. But there you have my friend. Oh, I get to drink it. An Aperol yes. Spritz. Wow, that's beautiful. I'm, I'm going to take a sip. I want to check in with Julia in Chicago and see if you got uh, any Spritz stories, any twists on a classic looks, Aperol Spritz. Hmm. <laughs> that looks absolutely amazing. I am more in the camp for something a touch more abrasively bitter. And so I go for the Campari Spritz. It's one ah. of my absolute favorites. Uh, when in Milan, I remember sitting at this tiny little cafe under the Duomo and sipping on Campari spritzes and seeing people drinking Campari sodas next to me and just the intensity of the color, the bitterness, the bubbles, the intensity of the refreshment uh, is second to none. So I'm so thirsty watching you make this spritz right now. I love it. I love it. So, you know, uh, talking about the spritzes and, and, and you know, we're, we're here to talk about cocktails, right? And I think uh, I have an idea for what could be a fun rabbit hole to get in together. Uh, I, the spritz reminds me of another fantastic sparkling wine-based cocktail, the French 75. Oh, yeah. And I think it would be really cool if we took the French 75 and threw it against the floor, uh, not literally, and <laughs> broke it everywhere, and then rebuilt it from our different personas. Now, if we had an Aspen glass to serve it in, we could throw it against the floor. Funny you should mention that. I was thinking I'd use the Aspen glass. So uh, how about this? How about I make a classic French 75, and we talk about what, what it means to make a classic French 75, and then, uh, then y'all just kind of riff on it. Well, before you jump in, I've got a, a question, I, and I've researched drinks for all my life. In the French 75, I can't find a solid answer, cognac or gin. Uh, so I have also been unable to find a solid answer. I, so in, as you probably have figured out, in half the books, they, uh, they reference cognac as the initial. And the reason being is the French 75 is named after a, a field artillery piece. Mm -hmm. um, and they figure if it was a French 75 and the French brandy, it was probably cognac. But here's the thing about the history of cocktails. The people recording them, we're also drinking a lot. And so, you know, it gets a little fuzzy at times. Obviously, uh, like many cocktails during um, the kind of real explosion worldwide, gin became such a primary driving force. And it makes a fantastic French 75. So Absolutely. I would, I would make one with gin if, if it's all right with you. I'm, I, I made you a drink. Maybe you'll make me one. I'd love to. <laughs> so I'll, I'm going to uh, dip also into the Bormioli line and pull one of these beautiful champagne flutes. This is traditionally what you find a lot of people serving French 75s in. Um, though, again, just like the recipe, you do not absolutely have to stick hard and fast to one style of glass. Do you? And we'll talk about that when we're riffing, I'm sure. So here we're starting, and we're, we, we have our beautiful, tall, tight glass. This is going to help hold those bubbles in. Mm -hmm. And now I'll start building the drink. I'm going to use a modern mixologist uh, mixing glass, which has these handy-dandy measurements, but I'll be measuring uh, with the jigger today. So starting with some of that fresh-squeezed lemon juice, I'm actually going to uh, put in 3 quarters of an ounce of lemon in this one because I like putting a good plug of that sparkling wine in there and nice. I love the brightness of the citrus working through. Then we're going to go back to that simple syrup. I'm going to use a half of an ounce of that made by the famous Tony <laughs> Abuganum himself this morning without heat of an oven or, or a, a stove, I'll say. Bombay Sapphire, again, as you mentioned earlier, a wonderfully aromatic, bright gin to use. I'm going to use an ounce and a half there. 
And then the easy part, we're just going to add ice, shake, and finish. So icing all the way up to the top of my glass. Again, just like Tony did before, I'm going to drop that shaker tin onto the top. This is what would be considered a Boston mm -hmm. set, right? I'm going to pop that sealed. Again, shaking, not faking. Even <laughs> Julia can tell this is a real shake, and she's in Chicago. <laughs> It looks nice and cold. Don't you love that sound? Looking good. <laughs> I do. It's refreshment in the ear right now. <laughs> All right. I'm going to separate or break my shaker. And using, well, thank you, a uh, beautiful uh, modern mixologist Hawthorne strainer, okay, also known as a plate and coil. I am going to pour the goodies right into that flute. Lovely. Now, French, right? Prosecco, not so French. That's a little more Italian. So we're actually going to go with some champagne for the French 75, which is a traditional accompaniment here. Uh, any kind of brute, nice, crisp, dry champagne would be ideal. Nice. Thanks. Nice. I've practiced a couple <laughs> thousand times. I'm also going to use, Tony, would you hand me that braided bar spoon of yours? Please? Absolutely. This is a little trick uh, that I learned while in Vegas. If you just set that bar spoon into your flute and pour the bubbles, they will follow the braid straight down the spoon. This will uh, suppress any tendency in the drink to bubble all over the glass, thus wetting the bar unnecessarily and wasting valuable champagne for the mouth. Boy, I guess there's that old saying, you're never too uh, old to learn new tricks. That's a <laughs> Thank you for sharing that. Absolutely. It, it's, it, it, I, I'd be remiss if I couldn't share something with you. Yeah. Oh, you know what, actually? As Tony did earlier, spare the spoon. Save the bubble. I'm just going to very gently stir that through. Mm -hmm. You'll see a uniform color there. And then I'll finish it with a lovely maraschino cherry. It'll rest on a skewer, a little peel of lemon. I'm going to express this lemon with the skin side over the drink to let out all of that nice citrus oil. Because remember, drinking a cocktail with your nose is as important as drinking it with your mouth. And I'll set that in. And now I get to present you, uh, my friends, a French 75. Thank you so much. That looks beautiful. Mm. So tell me, Julia. How about your French 75 riff? <laughs> Let's start with you, because I, I feel like with your background and the bar that you're uh, standing behind in Chicago, um, you, you would come at this from a very different uh, uh, point of view. Absolutely. Thank you so much. And that looks absolutely delicious. Well, so you. when I think about recipes, like you said, Greg, I think of them as templates, as something where we can pull one thing out, bring in another, sometimes pull one ingredient out, bring in two more ingredients, and start to really build on the complexity while keeping it very fresh and clean and simple. The French 75 gives such a brilliant template, and I'm going to side with you partially on this one, working with gin, but I'm also going to bring in an honorary grape ingredient in the form of sherry. So keeping it nice and low proof and sessionable. So let's get mixing. I'll be working with a beautiful three piece cobbler shaker for my version today. And starting off with some lemon juice, going for just a quarter of an ounce. So keeping it nice and light because being from Japan, I like to bring in ingredients from my home country and really tie in some of my heritage to the drinks that I make. So in my hand is a yuzu shu or a yuzu sake made from a Japanese citrus that has been imbued into a gorgeous junmai sake, a pure rice sake. So this is going to offer some floral notes, some tart notes, and just a touch of bitterness as well. Now coming in for that beautiful sherry that I mentioned, a fino sherry, crisp, dry, clean, this is going to offer almost an apple note, like a manzanilla-like note as well, bringing in a full ounce of the sherry. And next for the base spirit, as it were, a Japanese gin, 
This is Nika Coffee Gin. Coffee as in the name of the person who developed the column still in which they distill this gin. And this is one of the most, I call it a jubilant gin. They have about four different types of Japanese citrus in there. Amonatsu Shikuasa, Yuzu, there's Sancho, which is a very bright, zippy berry. And this gin just is so lively. So it only takes a little bit. I'm adding half an ounce of the gin to my shaker tin. I've had this gorgeous Rona Coupe chilling on the side, so we're opting for a differently shaped glass for my version. Being that the, the gin and the sherry, the yuzu, everything is so bright and vivacious, I wanted to offer a, a glass that would kind of hold those aromatics and open them up to the nose. The secret ingredient for my French 75 variation, which really sets it apart, is a touch of a coconut liqueur, Japan being an island country. We have beautiful citrus and whatnot, but there's also a really incredible tropical culture down in the Southern Islands of Japan. So I wanted to pay an homage to that as well. And my glass chilled, all of the beautiful ingredients in the tin. I'm going to give this a nice shake to wake it all up. Being that I am working with some lower proof ingredients, just doing a short shake for this, just enough to aerate, just enough to chill, straining it into my coop. I can already smell the coconut and the yuzu coming from this glass. I wish you could smell it too. No, I too so have some bad. gorgeous champagne with which to top off my cocktail, coming in with a couple ounces of that champagne, just free pouring it in there. I might add a splash more later, who knows? <laughs> and for the garnish, bringing in a couple of elements, a manicured lime twist for some nice contrasting aromatic notes. And then I'm going to finish it with just an expression of lemon oils over the top. And this is my Yuzu Coconut 75. Wow. Cheers. That, cheers. That, oh, that. Hello. <laughs> this looks very delicious. Thank you. don't you. mind if I try this? Would you like to try this? Be great. There you go. Drinks are meant to be enjoyed. That's right. We have a surprise for our viewers today, don't we? You do we have do. a surprise, not we, you have the surprise. <laughs> Why don't you tell our viewers what they can expect from you in October? Thank you so much. So for the past two years, I've been working on writing a cocktail book. It's called The Way of the Cocktail, highlighting Japanese bartending spirits, techniques, and ingredients. So I hope that you'll check it out. It's The Way of the Cocktail, and it's coming out in October. Great, yeah. fabulous. Cheers Thank to you. you. Thank Cheers. you very much. And we're going to throw it back to our friends in Youngstown. The party in Chicago is about to begin. <laughs> That's amazing. Cheers. That's amazing. Julia, congratulations. That uh, not just about the book, which is significant, but that drink this looked absolutely gorgeous. fantastic. <laughs> right? I mean, Thank and, and you so much. I, I could almost Thank taste you. it the way you described it, Julia. I am very complex. And, and it shows you how you can take that template of the French 75 and really get creative. But a lot of things that you talked about, Julia, in the enjoyment of the cocktail, from the proper glassware, the way the drink feels. Um, we talked about the aromatics of the drink, the visual, including that beautiful garnish you prepared, um, the taste, obviously. But Greg, my favorite, and Julia, if you were here, maybe you could even raise a glass. My favorite sense that we enjoy a drink with is the sense of hearing when two of these beautiful glasses come together. Good call. Happiness. Happiness, Julia. I have to Julia. join. join <laughs> yes, some you do. Here. Yeah. <laughs> nice. Happiness. Cheers. Happiness. Cheers. Mm. So, Tony, I'm curious. Uh, so yummy. I, I mean, Thank well you. done. Thank you. It's, I bet you that one's more yummy. <laughs> uh, however, I am curious as to what your riff on a French 75 would be. Well, I don't know if it's really a riff as much as it is the presentation. Um, I really, I, I like it to be more of a party in a glass. And, and I get a little more creative. And we have this beautiful Borman Lorley glass that, uh, from the new line. And this is going to be the vessel to set this in motion. Um, I'm going to go ahead and ask you once again if you'll ice that for me while I prepare. I, I follow a 1-1-2 recipe on any of the sweet and sour type of recipes, be it a classic sour, be it a Collins, be it a fizz. So I'm going to start with one ounce of our fresh squeezed lemon juice. And we'll just go ahead. We just squeezed this this morning. So we add that right into the mixing glass of the Boston Shaker set. Hey, Greg, any idea why they call it a Boston Shaker? 
You know what? I actually have no idea why they call it Boston Shaker. All I know is that it was the shaker set that my grandfather used when he was bartending. And uh, he had a note in his Mr. Boston's book, which became mine uh, you know, after Keep he had safe. passed. Uh, and in it, it says, only shake with a Boston shaker. Well, but I don't know why it's called the Boston I, Shaker. I, I don't know why. If anyone out there watching knows why it's called the Boston Shaker, if you answer that question, we got a prize for you. Yeah. Um, but for those of you who aren't familiar with it, it is the 16 ounce mixing glass. In the Modern Mixologist line, we etch the measurements on the glass for you. And the 26 ounce brushed stainless steel mixing tin, this is the same tin that also works with the 18 ounce brushed stainless steel small tin if you're a tin on tin person. Um, okay, so without ice, so we can see the ingredients going in, we have the one ounce of lemon juice. I balance that with one ounce of simple syrup. As Greg alluded to, this was a one-to-one -one simple. So two parts of our gin, and I love a cognac-based uh, French 75. I don't know about you, but I'm more inclined to drink a cognac French 75 in the winter, in the cooler months, Agreed. than in the summer. Agreed. So two ounces of our Bombay Sapphire Gin right into the mixing glass. Now, the reason we're not mixing with ice is because we're having a nice conversation, we're visiting, we haven't started the dilution process. Now, I add the ice to the mixing shaker, to the tin itself, fill that about two-thirds of the way full, and then we transfer the drink to the tin. It's so funny. Your technique is perfect for you, different than my technique. Um, Do you know how I developed that technique? Del de Groff. No, years of training. <laughs> although, yeah, yes. No, years of training bartenders, and they would uh, be so focused on putting ice in their tin that they'd knock over the glass full of spirit. And so I said, okay, just put the ice in there so you'll be very careful. But, See, I'm learning but, all kinds but of but new you're, things. You're right. I mean, it, bartending. <laughs> like anything else is a dance, it's an art, and it's how we move comfortably when we're doing it. You're absolutely right. Um, the way I set the shaker, uh, I put the glass on a slight angle, I twist, I pop, and if we've set it correctly, it won't come apart. You wanna shake it like a large piston. So you wanna throw the drink from one end to the other. So as Harry Craddock said, you, you wake the drink up. Ah, uh, yeah. All right, now to break this shaker, it's two fingers on the glass, two fingers on the tin. Right here is your sweet spot with the palm of your hand on the tin. We pop the sweet spot, comes right apart. If you'll hand me that Hawthorne strainer, which was designed to work beautifully with the mixing beaker for stirred cocktails, but also the mixing tin for anything shaken. Pour that in a beautiful ice-filled glass. Ah, gorgeous. Now. You'll notice I'm serving it long, over cubes, a longer drink designed to be enjoyed over a longer period of time. I'll also trouble you for that champagne to finish that and put about three ounces of ice cold champagne right on top. Uh, getting happy. I love that opalescent. It looks like a giant pearl that it's, someone plucked <laughs> from the ocean. <laughs> Thank you. Using the uh, 24 degree modern mixologist spoon, just enough to incorporate it. And this is where the real fun for me comes, is with the garnish. I've got sliced lemon, I've got sliced oranges. I do it almost like a sangria, some sliced strawberries go in there. And then our good friend, Farmer Lee, brought these beautiful, beautiful, different edible flowers. We've got different edible flowers. He brought some, uh, what are these called again? Egyptian star flowers. <sighs> How sexy. Because you, my friend, are a star flower. <laughs> <laughs> well, they are sexy, for sure. Um, I've got some both chocolate mint and some pineapple mint. Look at how beautiful that is. And again, and the for, aromatics. Uh, for those of you uh, who are not standing in front of our bar, let me tell you, when you open a clamshell or a, a container of herbs from the chef's garden, immediately the entire room smells of just the most fragrant, beautiful sense of nature. Uh, I highly, highly recommend bringing in their, their product to augment your, your, uh, your, your bar garnish because it really elevates. You're absolutely right. And drinking with our eyes, that is just gorgeous. And I hope it tastes Do you as know good what as this it is? looks. This is one of those drinks that when you serve it to someone, everyone up and down the bar says, 
what's that? What's that? I want one of those. <laughs> so anyway, well, cheers if I have to take another sip of one of Tony's delicious drinks. Let me twist your arm just a little bit, Greg. <laughs> it's absolutely fantastic. Surprise, surprise. <laughs> Although it also makes me think, because I've now had several sips of your drinks today, uh, it, it, we would be remiss if we did not discuss the extremely poignant uh, kind of burgeoning uh, uh, segment of bar culture that is non-alcoholic beverages, right? We have had uh, amazing, amazing growth in that sector. And, you know, for, uh, from, a, from a profitability standpoint, putting a little more emphasis into what you're offering your guests for a non-alcoholic selection makes all the sense in the world. And so I just got it in my mind that I'm going to do my French 75 riff non-alcoholically. Beautiful. Or, and or at least try. Well, like <laughs> and you here's said. the test. If you can taste it <laughs> and say that it tastes like a French 75, then we've done our job, right? Because a really well-made non-alcoholic beverage should bring the same sensorial experience that a cocktail does, that a, an amazing uh, glass of wine does. So uh, I guess I should get started. All right. So... Uh, I'm going to attempt to recreate the same kind of flavor profile of a French 75 made with cognac, but not using cognac, obviously, or even sparkling wine. I'm going to build mechanically the same way that we would build a cocktail. Why? Because the guest deserves there to be steps involved in the process for them to engage in what the magic and the artistry and the alchemy of what we do. So again, I'm going to start with some fresh lemon juice using that wonderful graduated jigger from the Modern Mixologist line. I've uh, prepared, while Tony wasn't looking, some sorghum syrup. Uh, sorghum uh, being a wonderful um, cane plant, it is reduced down into a, a molasses style reduction. Very heady, very umami centric, uh, very rich. Um, Julia, correct me if I'm wrong, but sorghum has a lot of play in, in, uh, in Japanese uh, beverage world. Is that correct? I think she said yes. All right. <laughs> she, so she I'm going to do, yes. do a quarter of an <laughs> ounce of that uh, sorghum syrup made the same way we do uh, a simple syrup. I've also made a lemon cordial. Tony earlier um, was preparing our lemons, and they were roughly the size of an elephant's calf. <laughs> so we took those skins and, uh, and we were able to make a, a cordial. Um, basically, a cordial is a fortified simple syrup, right? Very rich with the citrus oil in there. So we're going to add a half of an ounce of lemon cordial. But not to be confused with uh, uh, alcoholic cordial. Correct. That's a good point, too. Yeah, cordials also represent uh, a, a line of... Um, uh, what would you call them? Like sugar reinforced after dinner? Yes. Liqueurs? Syrupy, that, yes. Um, almost almost a, a twist on a flavored simple syrup. Okay, the last component, uh, because I want there to be, there's the bright acidity of the citrus, right? But I want there to be tannins, the tannins that you'd pull out of uh, the wood finish in the cognac brandy. So I'm going to use some brewed black tea here that's just been allowed to come up to room temperature. I'm going to use just under a full ounce of that. You know, the great thing, Greg, is that a non-alcoholic drink doesn't need to be boring. It can no, be no. just as complex, just as interesting, just as delicious as something that contains sparkling wine, that contains gin, that contains a variety of different alcohols. I completely agree. I'm going to test myself with the Tony-style shake, <laughs> shake or ice, icing my tin first. Uh, for, for my serving vessel, I'm going to dip into the... Uh, the Aspen line um, that uh, Dino was speaking about earlier. So, hit, oh, oh, whoa, <laughs> did you see that? Because it's unbreakable, and that's amazing to me. Uh, so we've got what looks like a, a beautiful coupe, right? Uh, uh, another possible option for a French 75. Okay, so I'm going to pour my liquid over ice. Now, as Julia mentioned, with her lower ABV, this has no ABV, right? It does not call for the same kind of dilution and aeration that a cocktail would. So a very brief shake. Love that sound. 
again, popping that glass off. And this time around, because I want a very particular mouthfeel, I'm going to use the fine strainer, also from the MM line. I'm going to pour my fortified non drink drink through there. And how do we get the bubbles, right? Well, there are options club soda, but we've used a lot of club soda. So I'm going to use chilled tonic water here. The tonic, again, the quinine, mm. will help bring out a more complex mouthfeel. That is beautiful. A brief stir through, and then I will finish with a tiny little sprig of that chocolate mint from the chef's garden. I'm going to hand you this, and I have to say, real quick, folks, Tony mentioned earlier, put in your favorite, uh, what was it, recipe, right? Well, your favorite cocktail. Put in I your think. favorite cocktail, yeah, your favorite your recipe. Favorite We've got a ton of modern mixologist bar kits that we want to give to you. So hit your social media platforms, bury us with your favorite cocktail <laughs> names so that we can bury you in delicious bar tools. Fantastic. And, uh, Tony, I have to say, though this was a different approach to our normal cocktail yes, it was. party. Uh, you but have fun always... just the same. Absolutely. So much fun. Absolutely. But you're the best Toastmaster I've ever known. Uh, thank you so much. And, and I, I think you should do a toast. I, 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 Greg, it's been a pleasure sharing the stage with you, with Julia in Chicago, with all of our Steelite family. And I, yeah, I would. I'd love to share a little toast with everyone. If you'd raise your glass, if you're drinking along. And it goes like this. In the presence of a well-made French 75, riff on a French 75, non-alcoholic French 75, taunt nerves relax, taunt muscles relax, friendships deepen, and the whole world becomes a better place in which to live. Here's happiness, everyone. Cheers, Tony. Cheers, Greg. Lovely as always. Julia, cheers to you in Chicago and to the whole team there. Cheers to you. Come by. Come by. Come by. Thank you so much. Sure. <laughs> I think that uh, I think we should get John and Sonny in here. That's what I think. I think it's best way to wrap up this wonderful yeah. party. Sonny? You guys can't drink without us. <laughs> no. Can't John. Toast without us. <laughs> we want to thank this crew. <laughs> Pretty nice. Guys, we want to thank you no matter where you watched, whether it was Zoom, Facebook, YouTube. Thank you for being part of the discussion, leaving comments for all of the giveaways, and of course, for looking at all of these gorgeous pieces as we launch the hospitality industry back into full steam. Yeah, listen, looking at the social media platforms, cannot thank so many of you for attending the event. It's really meaningful to, to us, the whole Steelite family. We look forward to seeing you next year at the National Restaurant Show. These two guys will be on this side of the bar, myself and the Steelite team on the other side of the bar. And Sonny, we hope you come back and join us. I would love that. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Cheers. 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 <laughs> Salute.